Recorded Books presents an unabridged recording of the lives of Christopher Chant, the second book in Volume 1 of the Chronicles of Crestomancy, by Diane Wynne-Jones, narrated by Gerard Doyle. Chapter 1 It was years before Christopher told anyone about his dreams. This was because he mostly lived in the nurseries at the top of the big London house, and the nursery maids who looked after him changed every few months. He scarcely saw his parents. When Christopher was small, he was terrified that he would meet Papa out walking in the park one day and not recognise him. He used to kneel down and look through the banisters on the rare days when Papa came home from the city before bedtime, hoping to fix Papa's face in his mind. All he got was a foreshortened view of a figure in a frock coat with a great deal of well-combed black whisker handing a tall black hat to the footman, and then a view of a very neat white parting in black hair as Papa marched rapidly under the stairway and out of sight. Beyond knowing that Papa was taller than most footmen, Christopher knew little else. Some evenings, Mama was on the stairs to meet Papa, blocking Christopher's view with wide silk skirts and a multitude of frills and draperies. Remind your master, she would say icily to the footman, that there is a reception in this house tonight, and that he is required for once in his life to act as host. Papa, hidden behind Mama's wide clothing, would reply in a deep, gloomy voice, Tell Madam, I have a great deal of work brought home from the office tonight. Tell her she should have warned me in advance. Inform your master, Mama would reply to the footman, that if I'd warned him, he would have found an excuse not to be here. "'Point out to him that it is my money that finances his business, "'and that I shall remove it if he does not do this small thing for me.' "'Then Papa would sigh. "'Tell Madam I am going up to dress,' he would say, "'under protest. "'Ask her to stand aside from the stairs.' "'Mama never did stand aside, to Christopher's disappointment.' She always gathered up her skirts and sailed upstairs ahead of Papa to make sure Papa did as she wanted. Mama had huge, lustrous eyes, a perfect figure, and piles of glossy black curls. The nursery maids told Christopher Mama was a beauty. At this stage in his life, Christopher thought everyone's parents were like this, but he did wish Mama would give him a view of Papa just once. He thought everyone had the kind of dreams he had, too. He did not think they were worth mentioning. The dreams always began the same way. Christopher got out of bed and walked around the corner of the night nursery wall, the part with the fireplace which jutted out, onto a rocky path high on the side of a valley. The valley was green and steep, with a stream rushing from waterfall to waterfall down the middle, but Christopher never felt there was much point in following the stream down the valley. Instead, he went up the path, around a large rock, into the part he always thought of as the place between. Christopher thought it was probably a leftover piece of the world from before somebody came along and made the world properly. Formless slopes of rock towered and slanted in all directions. Some of it was hard and steep, some of it piled and rubbly, and none of it had much shape. Nor did it have much colour. Most of it was the ugly brown you get from mixing every colour in a paint box. There was always a formless wet mist hanging around this place, adding to the vagueness of everything. You could never see the sky. In fact, Christopher sometimes thought there might not be a sky. He had an idea that the formless rock went on and on in a great arch overhead. But when he thought about it, that did not seem possible. Christopher always knew in his dream that you could get to almost anywhere from the place between. He called it almost anywhere because there was one place that did not want you to go to it. It was quite near, but he always found himself avoiding it. 
He set off, sliding, scrambling, edging across bulging wet rock, and climbing up or down until he found another valley and another path. There were hundreds of them. He called them the Anywheres. The Anywheres were mostly quite different from London. They were hotter or colder, with strange trees and stranger houses. Sometimes the people in them looked ordinary. Sometimes their skin was bluish or reddish, and their eyes were peculiar. But they were always very kind to Christopher. He had a new adventure every time he went on a dream. In the active adventures, people helped him escape through cellars of odd buildings, or he helped them in wars, or in rounding up dangerous animals. In the calm adventures, he got new things to eat, and people gave him toys. He lost most of the toys as he was scrambling back home over the rocks, but he did manage to bring back the shiny shell necklace the silly ladies gave him, because he could hang it around his neck. He went to the anywhere with the silly ladies several times. It had blue sea and white sand, perfect for digging and building in. There were ordinary people in it, but Christopher only saw them in the distance. The silly ladies came and sat on rocks out of the sea and giggled at him while he made sandcastles. Oh, Christopher! They would coo in lisping voices. Tell us what makes you a Christopher. And they would burst into screams of high laughter. They were the only ladies he had seen without clothes on. Their skins were greenish, and so was their hair. He was fascinated by the way the ends of them were big silvery tails that could curl and flip almost like a fish could, and send powerful sprays of water over him from their big finned feet. He never could persuade them that he was not a strange animal called a Christopher. Every time he went to that anywhere, the latest nursery maid complained about all the sand in his bed. He had learned very early on that they complained even louder when they found his pajamas muddy, wet, and torn from climbing through the place between. He took a set of clothes out onto the rocky path and left them there to change into. He had to put new clothes there every year or so when he grew out of the latest torn and muddy suit. But the nursery maids changed so often that none of them noticed. Nor did they notice the strange toys he brought back over the years. There was a clockwork dragon, a horse that was really a flute, and the necklace from the silly ladies, which, when you looked closely, was a string of tiny pearl skulls. Christopher thought about the silly ladies. He looked at his latest nursemaid's feet. And he thought that her shoes were about big enough to hide the flippers at the end of her tail, but you could never see any more of any lady because of her skirts. He kept wondering how Mama and the nursery maid walked about on big limber tails and flippers instead of legs and feet. His chance to find out came one afternoon when the nursery maid put him into an unpleasant sailor suit and led him downstairs to the drawing room. Mama and some other ladies were there with someone called Lady Badgett. Who was a kind of cousin of Papa's? She had asked to see Christopher. Christopher stared at her long nose and her wrinkles. "Is she a witch, Mama?" he asked loudly. Everyone except Lady Badgett, who went more wrinkled than ever, said, "Hush, dear." After that, Christopher was glad to find they seemed to have forgotten him. He quietly lay down on his back on the carpet. And rolled from lady to lady. When they caught him, he was under the sofa gazing up Lady Badgett's petticoats. He was dragged out of the room in disgrace, very disappointed to discover that all the ladies had big, thick legs, except Lady Badgett. Her legs were thin and yellow like a chicken's. Mama sent for him in her dressing room later that day. Oh, Christopher, how could you? She said. I just got Lady Badgett to the point of calling on me, and she'll never come again. You've undone the work of years. It was very hard work. Christopher realised being a beauty. Mama was very busy in front of her mirror with all sorts of little cut glass bottles and jars. Behind her, a maid was even busier, far busier than the nursery maids ever were, working on Mama's glossy curls. Christopher was so ashamed to have wasted all this work 
that he picked up a glass jar to hide his confusion. Mamma told him sharply to put it down. Money isn't everything, you see, Christopher, she explained. A good place in society is worth far more. Lady Badgett could have helped us both. Why do you think I married your papa? Since Christopher had simply no idea what could have brought Mamma and Papa together, he put out his hand to pick up the jar again. But he remembered in time that he was not supposed to touch it, and picked up a big pad of false hair instead. He turned it around in his hands while Mamma talked. You are going to grow up with Papa's good family and my money, she said. I want you to promise me now that you will take your place in society alongside the very best people. Mamma intends you to be a great man. Christopher, are you listening? Christopher had given up trying to understand Mamma. He held the false hair out instead. What's this for? Bulking out my hair, Mamma said. Please attend, Christopher. It's very important you begin now preparing yourself for the future. Put that hair down. Christopher put the pad of hair back. I thought it might be a dead rat, he said. And somehow Mamma must have made a mistake, because to Christopher's great interest, the thing really was a dead rat. Mamma and her maid both screamed. Christopher was hustled away while a footman came running with a shovel. After that, Mamma called Christopher to her dressing room and talked to him quite often. He stood, trying to remember not to fiddle with the jars, staring at his reflection in her mirror. Wondering why his curls were black and Mamma's rich brown, and why his eyes were so much more like coal than Mamma's. Something seemed to stop there ever being another dead rat, but sometimes a spider could be encouraged to let itself down in front of the mirror whenever Mamma's talk became too alarming. He understood that Mamma cared very urgently about his future. He knew he was going to have to enter society with the best people, but the only society he had heard of was the Aid the Heathen Society that he had to give a penny to every Sunday in church, and he thought Mamma meant that. Christopher made careful inquiries from the nursery maid with the big feet. She told him heathens were savages who ate people. Missionaries were the best people, and they were the ones heathens ate. Christopher saw that he was going to be a missionary when he grew up. He found Mamma's talk increasingly alarming. He wished she had chosen another career for him. He also asked the nursery maid about the kind of ladies who had tails like fish. Oh, you mean mermaids? The girl said, laughing. Those aren't real. Christopher knew mermaids were not real because he only met them in dreams. Now he was convinced that he would meet heathens too if he went to the wrong almost anywhere. For a time, he was so frightened of meeting heathens that when he came to a new valley from the place between, he lay down and looked carefully at the anywhere it led to to see what the people were like there before he went on. But after a while, when nobody tried to eat him, he decided that the heathens probably lived in the anywhere which stopped you going to it, and gave up worrying until he was older. When he was a little older, people in the anywheres sometimes gave him money. Christopher learned to refuse coins. As soon as he touched them, everything just stopped. He landed in bed with a jolt and woke up sweating. Once this happened when a pretty lady who reminded him of Mamma tried laughingly to hang an earring in his ear. Christopher would have asked the nursery maid with big feet about it, but she had left long ago. Most of the ones who came after simply said, "Don't bother me now. I'm busy." When he asked them things, until he learned to read, Christopher thought this was what all nursery maids did. They stayed a month, too busy to talk, and then set their mouths in a nasty line and flounced out. He was amazed to read of old retainers who stayed with families for a whole lifetime. And could be persuaded to tell long and sometimes very boring stories about the family in the past. In his house, none of the servants stayed more than six months. The reason seemed to be that Mamma and Papa had given up speaking to one another, even through the footman. They handed the servants notes to give to one another instead. 
Since it never occurred to either Mama or Papa to seal the notes, sooner or later someone would bring the note up to the nursery floor and read it aloud to the nursery maid. Christopher learned that Mama was always short and to the point. Mr. Chant is requested to smoke cigars only in his own room. Or, will Mr. Chant please take note that the new laundry maid has complained of holes burned in his shirts? Or, Mr. Chant caused me much embarrassment by leaving in the middle of my breakfast party. Papa usually let the notes build up and then answered the lot in a kind of rambling rage. My dear Miranda, I shall smoke where I please, and it is the job of that lazy laundry maid to deal with the results. But then your extravagance in employing foolish layabouts and rude louts is only for your own selfish comfort and never for mine. If you wish me to remain at your parties, try to employ a cook who knows bacon from old shoes and refrain from giving that idiotic, tinkling laugh all the time. Papa's replies usually cause the servants to leave overnight. Christopher rather enjoyed the insight these notes gave him. Papa seemed more like a person somehow, even if he was so critical. It was quite a blow to Christopher when he was cut off from them by the arrival of his first governess. Mama sent for him. She was in tears. Your papa has overreached himself this time, she said. It's a mother's place to see to the education of her child. I want you to go to a good school, Christopher. It's most important. But I don't want to force you into learning. I want your ambition to flower as well. But your papa comes crashing in with his grim notions and goes behind my back by appointing this governess who, knowing your papa, is bound to be terrible. Oh, my poor child! Christopher realised that the governess was his first step towards becoming a missionary. He felt solemn and alarmed. But when the governess came, she was simply a drab lady with pink eyes who was far too discreet to talk to servants. She only stayed a month, to Mama's jubilation. Now we can really start your education, Mama said. I shall choose the next governess myself. Mama said that quite often over the next two years, for governesses came and went just like nursery maids before them. They were all drab, discreet ladies, and Christopher got their names muddled up. He decided that the chief difference between a governess and a nursery maid was that a governess usually burst into tears before she left, and that was the only time a governess ever said anything interesting about Mama and Papa. I'm sorry to do this to you, the third, or maybe the fourth, governess wept, because you're a nice little boy, even if you are a bit remote. But the atmosphere in this house... Every night he's home, which, thank God, is rarely. I have to sit at the dining table with them in utter silence, and she passes me a note to give to him, or he passes me one for her. Then they open the notes and look daggers at one another, and then at me. I can't stand any more. The ninth, or maybe the tenth, governess was even more indiscreet. I know they hate one another, she sobbed, but she's no call to hate me too. She's one of those who can't abide other women. And she's a sorceress, I think. I can't be sure, because she only does little things, and he's at least as strong as she is. He may even be an enchanter. Between them they make such an atmosphere. It's no wonder they can't keep any servants. Oh, Christopher, forgive me for talking like this about your parents. All the governesses asked Christopher to forgive them, and he forgave them very readily. For this was the only time now that he had news of Mama and Papa. It gave him a wistful sort of feeling that perhaps other people had parents who were not like this. He was also sure that there was some sort of crisis brewing. The hushed thunder of it reached as far as the schoolroom, even though the governesses would not let him gossip with the servants any more. He remembered the night the crisis broke because that was the night when he went to an anywhere where a man under a yellow umbrella gave him a sort of candlestick of little bells. It was so beautiful that Christopher was determined to bring it home. He held it in his teeth as he scrambled across the rocks of the place between. To his joy, 
It was in his bed when he woke up. But there was quite a different feeling to the house. The twelfth governess packed and left straight after breakfast. Two. Christopher was called to Mama's dressing room that afternoon. There was a new governess sitting on the only hard chair, wearing the usual sort of ugly greyish clothes and a hat that was uglier than usual. Her drab cotton gloves were folded on her dull bag, and her head hung down as if she were timid or put upon, or both. Christopher found her of no interest. All the interest in the room was centred on the man standing behind Mama's chair, with his hand on Mama's shoulder. Christopher, this is my brother, Mama said happily. Your uncle Rafe. Mama pronounced it Rafe. It was more than a year before Christopher discovered it was the name he read as Ralph. Uncle Rafe took his fancy completely. To begin with, he was smoking a cigar. The scents of the dressing room were changed and mixed with the rich incense-like smoke, and Mama was not protesting by even so much as sniffing. That alone was enough to show that Uncle Rafe was in a class by himself. Then he was wearing tweeds, strong and tangy and almost fox-coloured, which were a little baggy here and there, but blended beautifully with the darker foxiness of Uncle Rafe's hair and the redder foxiness of his moustache. Christopher had seldom seen a man in tweeds or without whiskers. This did even more to assure him that Uncle Rafe was someone special. As a final touch, Uncle Rafe smiled at him like sunlight on an autumn forest. It was such an engaging smile that Christopher's face broke into a return smile almost of its own accord. Hello, old chap, said Uncle Rafe. Rolling out blue smoke above Mama's glossy hair, I know this is not the best way for an uncle to recommend himself to a nephew, but I've been sorting the family affairs out, and I'm afraid I've had to do one or two quite shocking things, like bringing you a new governess, and arranging for you to start school in the autumn. Governess over there, Miss Bell. I hope you like one another. Enough to forgive me, anyway. He smiled at Christopher in a sunny, humorous way, which had Christopher rapidly approaching adoration. All the same, Christopher glanced dubiously at Miss Bell. She looked back, and there was an instant when a sort of hidden prettiness in her almost came out into the open. Then she blinked pale eyelashes and murmured, "Pleased to meet you," in a voice as uninteresting as her clothes. She'll be your last governess, I hope. Said Mama. Because of that, Christopher ever after thought of Miss Bell as the last governess. She's going to prepare you for school. I wasn't meaning to send you away yet, but your uncle says. Anyway, a good education is important for your career, and to be blunt with you, Christopher, your papa has made a most vexatious hash of the money, which is mine, not his, as you know, and lost practically all of it. Luckily, I had your uncle to turn to, and. And once turned to, I don't let people down," Uncle Rafe said, with a quick flick of a glance at the governess. Maybe he meant she should not be hearing this. Fortunately, there's plenty left to send you to school, and then your mamma is going to recoup a bit by living abroad. She'll like that, eh, Miranda? And Miss Bell is going to be found another post with glowing references. Everyone's going to be fine. His smile went to all of them one by one, full of warmth and confidence. Mama laughed and dabbed scent behind her ears. The last governess almost smiled, so that the hidden prettiness half emerged again. Christopher tried to grin a strong, manly grin at Uncle Rafe, because that seemed to be the only way to express the huge, almost hopeless adoration that was growing in him. Uncle Rafe laughed a golden brown laugh. And completed the conquest of Christopher by fishing in a tweed pocket and tipping his nephew a bright new sixpence. Christopher would have died rather than spend that sixpence. 
whenever he changed clothes, he transferred the sixpence to the new pockets. It was another way of expressing his adoration of Uncle Rafe. It was clear that Uncle Rafe had stepped in to save Mama from ruin, and this made him the first good man that Christopher had met. And on top of that, he was the only person outside the Anywheres who had bothered to speak to Christopher in that friendly, man-to-man -man way. Christopher tried to treasure the last governors, too, for Uncle Rafe's sake, but that was not so easy. She was so very boring. She had a drab, calm way of speaking, and she never raised her voice or showed impatience, even when he was stupid about mental arithmetic or levitation, both of which all the other governesses had somehow missed out on. If a herring and a half cost three halfpence, Christopher, she explained drearily, that's a penny and a half for a fish and a half. How much for a whole fish? I don't know, he said, trying not to yawn. Very well, the last governess said calmly. We'll think again tomorrow. Now look in this little mirror and see if you can't make it rise in the air just an inch. But Christopher could not move the mirror any more than he could understand what a herring cost. The last governess put the mirror aside and quietly went on to puzzle him about French. After a few days of this, Christopher tried to make her angry, hoping she would turn more interesting when she shouted. But she just said calmly, Christopher, you're getting silly. You may play with your toys now, but remember you only take one out at a time, and you put that back before you get out another. That is our rule. Christopher had become rapidly and dismally accustomed to this rule. It reduced the fun a lot. He had also become used to the last governor sitting beside him while he played. The other governesses had seized the chance to rest, but this one sat in a hard chair, efficiently mending his clothes, which reduced the fun even more. Nevertheless, he got the candlestick of chiming bells out of the cupboard, because that was fascinating in its way. It was so arranged that it played different tunes, depending on which bell you touched first. When he had finished with it, the last governess paused in her darning to say, That goes in the middle of the top shelf. Put it back before you take that clockwork dragon. She waited to listen to the chiming that showed Christopher had done what she had said. Then, as she drove the needle into the sock again, she asked in her dullest way, Who gave you the bells, Christopher? No one had ever asked Christopher about anything he had brought back from the Anywheres before. He was rather at a loss. A man under a yellow umbrella he answered. He said they bring luck on my house. What man where? The last governess wanted to know, except that she did not sound as if she cared if she knew or not. And almost anywhere, Christopher said, the hot one with the smells and the snake charmers. The man didn't say his name. That's not an answer, Christopher, the last governess said calmly. But she did not say anything more, until the next time, two days later, when Christopher got out the chiming bells again. Remember where they go when you finish with them, she said. Have you thought yet where the man with the yellow umbrella was? Outside a painted place where some gods live, Christopher said, setting the small silvery bell cups ringing. He was nice. He said it didn't matter about money. Very generous, remarked the last governess. Where was this painted house for gods, Christopher? I told you, it was an almost anywhere, Christopher said. And I told you that that is not an answer, the last governess said. She folded up her darning. Christopher, I insist that you tell me where those bells came from. Why do you want to know? Christopher asked, wishing she would leave him in peace. Because the last governess said with truly ominous calm, You are not being frank and open like a nice boy should be. I suspect you stole those bells. At this monstrous injustice, Christopher's face reddened and tears stood in his eyes. I haven't, he cried out. He gave them to me. 
People always give me things in the anyways, only I drop most of them. Look. And regardless of her one toy at a time rule, he rushed to the cupboard, fetched the horse flute, the mermaid's necklace and the clockwork dragon, and banged them down in her darning basket. Look, these are from other anywheres. The last governess gazed at them with terrible impassiveness. Am I to believe you have stolen these too? she said. She put the basket and the toys on the floor and stood up. Come with me. This must be reported to your mamma at once. She seized Christopher's arm, and in spite of his yells of, I didn't, I didn't, she marched him inexorably downstairs. Christopher leaned backwards and dragged his feet and implored her not to. He knew he would never be able to explain to mamma. All the notice the last governess took was to say, Stop that disgraceful noise. You're a big boy now. This was something all the governesses agreed on. But Christopher no longer cared about being big. Tears poured disgracefully down his cheeks, and he screamed the name of the one person he knew who saved people. Uncle Rafe! I'll explain to Uncle Rafe! The last governess glanced down at him at that. Just for a moment, the hidden prettiness flickered in her face. But to Christopher's despair... She dragged him to Mamma's dressing room and knocked on the door. Mamma turned from her mirror in surprise. She looked at Christopher, red-faced and gulping and wet with tears. She looked at the last governess. Whatever is going on? Is he ill? No, madam, the last governess said in her dullest way. Something has happened which I think your brother should be informed of at once. Rafe, said Mamma. You mean I'm to write to Rafe? Or is it more urgent than that? Urgent, madam, I think, the last governess said drearily. Christopher says that he is willing to confess to his uncle. I suggest, if I may make so bold, that you summon him now. Mamma yawned. This governess bored her terribly. I'll do my best, she said. But I don't answer for my brother's temper. He lives a very busy life, you know. Carelessly, she pulled one of her dark, glossy hairs out of the silver-backed brush she had been using. Then, much more carefully, she began teasing hairs out of her silver and crystal hair tidy. Most of the hairs were Mamma's own dark ones, but Christopher, watching Mamma's beautiful pearly nails delicately pinching and pulling at the hairs, while he sobbed and swallowed and sobbed again, saw that one of the hairs was a much redder colour. This was the one Mamma pulled out. She laid it across her own hair from the brush. Then, picking up what seemed to be a hat pin with a glittery knob, she laid that across both hairs and tapped it with one sharp, impatient nail. Rafe, she said. Rafe Weatherby Argent, Miranda wants you. One of the mirrors of the dressing table turned out to be a window, with Uncle Rafe looking through it rather irritably while he knotted his tie. "'What is it?' he said. "'I'm busy today.' "'When aren't you?' asked Mamma. "'Listen, that governess is here, looking like a wet week, as usual. She's brought Christopher. Something about a confession. Could you come and sort it out? It's beyond me.' "'Is she?' said Uncle Rafe. He leaned sideways to look through the mirror, or window, or whatever, and when he saw Christopher, he winked and broke into his sunniest smile. Dear, dear, this does look upsetting. I'll be along at once. Christopher saw him leave the window and walk away to one side. Mamma had only time to turn to the last governess and say, There, I've done my best, before the door of her dressing room opened, and Uncle Rafe strode in. Christopher quite forgot his sobs in the interest of all this. He tried to think what was on the other side of the wall of Mamma's dressing room. The stairs, as far as he knew. He supposed Uncle Rafe could have a secret room in the wall about one foot wide, but he was much more inclined to think he had been seeing real magic. As he decided this, 
Uncle Rafe secretly passed him a large white handkerchief and walked cheerfully into the middle of the room to allow Christopher time to wipe his face. Now, what's all this about? he said. I have no idea, said Mamma. She'll explain, no doubt. Uncle Rafe cocked her ginger eyebrow at the last governess. I found Christopher playing with an artifact, the governess said tediously, of a kind I have never seen before, made of a metal that is totally unknown to me. He then revealed he had three more artifacts, each one different from the other, but he was unable to explain how he had come by them. Uncle Rafe looked at Christopher, who hid the handkerchief behind his back and looked nervously back. Enough to get anyone into hot water, old chap, Uncle Rafe said. Suppose you take me to look at these things and explain where they do come from. Christopher heaved a great happy sigh. He had known he could count on Uncle Rafe to save him. Yes, please, he said. They went back upstairs with the last governess processing ahead and Christopher hanging gratefully onto Uncle Rafe's large warm hand. When they got there, the governess sat quietly down to her sewing again as if she felt she had done her bit. Uncle Rafe picked up the bells and jingled them. By Jove, he said, these sound like nothing else in the universe. He took them to the window and carefully examined each bell. Bullseye, he said. You clever woman. They are like nothing else in the universe. Some kind of strange alloy, I think, different for each bell. Handmade by the look of them. He pointed genially to the tuffet by the fire. Sit there, old chap, and oblige me by explaining what you did to get these bells here. Christopher sat down, full of willing eagerness. I had to hold them in my mouth while I climbed through the place between, he explained. No, no said Uncle Rafe. That sounds like near the end. Start with what you did in the beginning, before you got the bells. I went down the valley to the snake-charming town, Christopher said. No, before that, old chap, said Uncle Rafe. When you set off from here. What time of day was it, for instance? After breakfast, before lunch? No, in the night, Christopher explained. It was one of the dreams. In this way, by going carefully back every time Christopher missed out a step, Uncle Rafe got Christopher to tell him in detail about the dreams and the place between and the almost anywheres he came to down the valleys. Since Uncle Rafe, far from being angry, seemed steadily more delighted, Christopher told him everything he could think of. What did I tell you? he said, possibly to the governess. I can always trust my hunches. Something had to come out of a heredity like this. By Jove, Christopher, old chap, you must be the only person in the world who can bring back solid objects from a spirit trip. I doubt if even old DeWitt can do that. Christopher glowed to find Uncle Rafe so pleased with him, but he could not help feeling resentful about the last governess. She said I stole them. Take no notice of her. Women are always jumping to the wrong conclusions, Uncle Rafe said, lighting a cigar. At this, the last governess shrugged her shoulders up and smiled a little. The hidden prettiness came out stronger than Christopher had ever seen it, almost as if she was human and sharing a joke. Uncle Rafe blew a roll of blue smoke over them both, beaming like the sun coming through clouds. Now the next thing, old chap, he said, is to do a few experiments to test this gift of yours. Can you control these dreams of yours? Can you say when you're about to go off to your almost anywheres? Or can't you? Christopher thought about it. I go when I want to, he said. Then have you any objection to doing me a test run, say tomorrow night? Uncle Rafe asked. I could go tonight, Christopher offered. No, tomorrow said Uncle Rafe. It'll take me a day to get things set up. And when you go, this is what I want you to do. He leaned forward and pointed his cigar at Christopher to let him know he was serious. You set out as usual when you're ready and try to do two experiments for me. First, I'm going to arrange to have a man waiting for you in your place between. 
I want you to see if you can find him. You may have to shout to find him. I don't know. I'm not a spirit traveller myself. But anyway, you climb about and see if you can make contact with him. If you do, then you do the second experiment. The man will tell you what that is. And if they both work, then we can experiment some more. Do you think you can do that? You'd like to help, wouldn't you, old chap? Yes, said Christopher. Uncle Rafe stood up and patted his shoulder. Good lad. Don't let anyone deceive you, old chap. You have a very exciting and important gift here. It's so important that I advise you not to talk about it to anyone but me and Miss Bell over there. Don't tell anyone, not even your mamma, right? Right, said Christopher. It was wonderful that Uncle Rafe thought him important. He was so glad and delighted that he would have done far more for Uncle Rafe than just not tell anyone. That was easy. There was no one to tell. So it's our secret, said Uncle Rafe, going to the door. Just the three of us. And the man I'm going to send, of course. Don't forget you may have to look quite hard to find him, will you? I won't forget, Christopher promised eagerly. Good lad, said Uncle Rafe, and went out of the door in a waft of cigar smoke. Christopher thought he would never live through the time until tomorrow night. He burned to show Uncle Rafe what he could do. If it had not been for the last governess, he would have made himself ill with excitement. But she managed to be so boring that she somehow made everything else boring too. By the time Christopher went to bed that next night, he was almost wondering if it was worth dreaming. But he did dream, because Uncle Rafe had asked him to, and got out of bed as usual and walked around the fireplace to the valley where his clothes were lying on the rocky path as usual. By now, this lot of clothes was torn, covered with mud and assorted filth from a hundred almost anywheres, and at least two sizes too small. Christopher put them on quickly, without bothering to do up buttons that would not meet. He never wore shoes, because they got in the way as he climbed the rocks. He pattered around the crag in his bare feet, into the place between. It was formless and unfinished as ever, all slides and jumbles of rock rearing in every direction and high overhead. The mist billowed as formlessly as the rocks. It was one of the times when rain slanted in it, driven this way and that by the hither-thither winds that blew in the place between. Christopher hoped he would not have to spend too long here hunting for Uncle Rafe's man. It made him feel so small, besides being cold and wet. He dutifully braced himself on a slide of rubbly sand and shouted, Hello! The place between made his voice sound no louder than a bird cheeping. The windy fog seemed to snatch the sound away and bury it in a flurry of rain. Christopher listened for a reply, but for minutes on end the only noise was the hissing hum of the wind. He was wondering whether to shout again when he heard a little cheeping thread of sound wailing its thin way back to him across the rocks. Hello! It was his own shout. Christopher was sure of it. Right from the start of his dreams, he had known that the place between liked to have everything that did not belong sent back to the place it came from. That was why he always climbed back to bed faster than he did when he climbed out to a new valley. The place pushed him back. Christopher thought about this. It probably did no good to shout. If Uncle Rafe's man was out there in the mist, he would not be able to stand and wait for very long without getting pushed back to the valley he came from. So the man would have to wait in the mouth of a valley and hope that Christopher found him. Christopher sighed. There were such thousands and thousands of valleys, high up, low down, turning off at every angle you could think of, and some valleys turned off other valleys, and that was only if you crawled around the side of the place that was nearest. If you went the other way, towards the anywhere that did not want people, there were probably many thousands more. 
on the other hand, Uncle Rafe would not want to make it too difficult. The man must be quite near. Determined to make Uncle Rafe's experiment a success if he could, Christopher set off, climbing, sliding, inching across wet rock with his face close to the cold, hard smell of it. The first valley he came to was empty. Hello! he called down it. But the river rushed down green, empty space, and he could see no one was there. He backed out and climbed up and sideways to the next. And there, before he reached the opening, he could see someone through the mist, dark and shiny with rain, crouching on a rock and scrabbling for a handhold overhead. Hello? Christopher asked. Well, I'll be. Is that Christopher? the person asked. It was a strong young man's voice. Come out where we can see one another. With a certain amount of heaving and slipping, both of them scrambled around a bulge of rock and dropped down into another valley, where the air was calm and warm. The grass here was lit pink by a sunset in the distance. Well, well, said Uncle Rafe's man. You're about half the size I expected. Pleased to meet you, Christopher. I'm Tackroy. He grinned down at Christopher. Tackroy was as strong and young as his voice, rather squarely and sturdily built, with a roundish brown face and merry-looking hazel eyes. Christopher liked him at once, partly because Tackroy was the first grown man he had met who had curly hair like his own. It was not quite like. Where Christopher's hair made loose black rounds, Tackroy's hair coiled tight, like a mass of little pale brown springs. Christopher thought Tackroy's hair must hurt when a governess or someone made him comb it. This made him notice that Tackroy's curls were quite dry, nor was there any trace of the shiny wetness that had been on his clothes a moment before. Tackroy was wearing a greenish worsted suit, rather shabby, but it was not even damp. How did you get dry so quickly? Christopher asked him. Tackroy laughed. I'm not here quite as bodily as you seem to be, and you're soaked through. How was that? The rain in the place between, Christopher said. You were wet there, too. Was I? said Tackroy. I don't visualise at all on the passage. It's more like night, with a few stars to guide by. I find it quite hard to visualise even here on the world edge, though I can see you quite well, of course, since we're both willing it. He saw that Christopher was staring at him, not understanding more than a word of this, and screwed up his eyes thoughtfully. This made little laughing wrinkles all around Tackroy's eyes. Christopher liked him better than ever. Tell me, Tackroy said, waving a brown hand towards the rest of the valley, what do you see here? A valley, Christopher said, wondering what Tackroy saw. With green grass. The sun's setting, and it's making the stream down the middle look pink. Is it now? said Tackroy. Then I expect it would surprise you very much to know that all I can see is a slightly pink fog. Why? said Christopher. Because I'm only here in spirit, while you seem to be actually here in the flesh, Tackroy said. Back in London, my valuable body is lying on a sofa in a deep trance, tucked up in blankets and warmed by stone-hot water bottles, while a beautiful and agreeable young lady plays tunes to me on her harp. I insisted on the young lady as part of my pay. Do you think you're tucked up in bed somewhere too? When Tackroy saw that this question made Christopher both puzzled and impatient, his eyes screwed up again. Let's get going, he said. The next part of the experiment is to see if you can bring a prepared package back. I've made my mark. Make yours and we'll get down into this world. Mark, said Christopher. Mark, said Tackroy. If you don't make a mark, how do you think you will find your way in and out of this world, or know which one it is when you come to it? Valleys are quite easy to find, Christopher protested. And I can tell that I've been to this anywhere before. It's got the smallest stream of all of them. Tackroy shrugged with his eyes screwed right up. My boy, you're giving me the creeps. Be kind and please me and scratch the number nine on a rock or something. 
I don't want to be the one who loses you. Christopher obligingly picked up a pointed flint and dug away at the mud of the path until he had made a large, wobbly nine there. He looked up to find Tackroy staring as if he was a ghost. What's the matter? Tackroy gave a short, wild-sounding laugh. Oh, nothing much. I can see it, that's all. That's only unheard of, that's all. Can you see my mark? Christopher looked everywhere he could think of, including up at the sunset sky, and had to confess that he could see nothing like a mark. Thank heaven, said Tackroy. At least that's normal. But I'm still seriously wondering what you are. I begin to understand why your uncle got so excited. They sauntered together down the valley. Tackroy had his hands in his pockets, and he seemed quite casual, but Christopher got the feeling, all the same, that Tackroy usually went into an anywhere in some way that was quicker and quite different. He caught Tackroy glancing at him several times, as if Tackroy was not sure of the way to go, and was waiting to see what Christopher did. He seemed very relieved when they came to the end of the valley, and found themselves on the rutty road among the huge jungle trees. The sun was almost down. There were lights at the windows of the tumble-down old inn in front of them. This was one of the first anywheres Christopher had been to. He remembered it hotter and wetter. The big trees had been bright green and dripping. Now they seemed brown and a bit wilted, as far as he could tell in the pink light. When he followed Tackroy onto the crazily built wooden veranda of the inn, he saw that the blobs of coloured fungus that had fascinated him last time had all turned dry and white. He wondered if the landlord would remember him. Landlord! Tackroy shouted. When nothing happened, he said to Christopher, Can you bang on the table? I can't. Christopher noticed that the bent boards of the veranda creaked under his own feet, but not under Tackroy's. It did seem as if Tackroy was not really here in some way. He picked up a wooden bowl and rapped hard on the twisted table with it. It was another thing that made Tackroy's eyes screw up. When the landlord shuffled out, he was wrapped in at least three knitted shawls and too unhappy to notice Christopher, let alone remember him. Rafe's messenger, Tackroy said. I believe you have a package for me. Ah, oh, yes, shivered the landlord. Won't you come inside out of this exceptionally bitter weather, sir? This is the hardest winter anyone has known for years. Tackroy's eyebrows went up and he looked at Christopher. I'm quite warm, Christopher said. Then we'll stay outside, Tackroy said. The package? Directly, sir, shivered the landlord. But won't you take something hot to warm you up? On the house, sir. Yes, please, Christopher said quickly. Last time he was here, he had been given something chocolatish, which was not cocoa, but much nicer. The landlord nodded and smiled and shuffled shivering back indoors. Christopher sat at the table. Even though it was almost dark now, he felt deliciously warm. His clothes were drying nicely. Crowds of fleshy moth things were flopping at the lighted windows, but enough light came between them for him to see Tackroy sit down in the air and then slide himself sideways onto the chair on the other side of the table. "'You'll have to drink whatever it is for me,' Tackroy said. "'That won't worry me,' Christopher said. "'Why did you tell me to write the number nine? "'Because this set of worlds is known as Series Nine, Tackroy explained. "'Your uncle seems to have a lot of dealings here.' That was why it was easy to set the experiment up. If it works, I think he's planning a whole set of trips all along the related worlds. You'd find that a bit boring, wouldn't you? Oh, no, I'd like it, Christopher said. How many are there after nine? Ours is twelve, said Tackroy. Then they go down to one, along the other way. Don't ask me why they go back to front. It's traditional. Christopher frowned over this. There were a great many more valleys than that in the place between, all arranged higgledy-piggledy, too, not in any neat way that made you need to count up to twelve. But he supposed there must be some way in which Tackroy knew best, 
or Uncle Rafe did. The landlord shuffled hastily out again. He was carrying two cups that steamed out a dark chocolate smell, although this lovely aroma was rather spoiled by a much less pleasant smell coming from a round leather container on a long strap, which he dumped on the table beside the cups. Here we are, he said. That's the package. And he is to take the chill off you and drink to further dealing, sir. I don't know how you two can stand it out here. We come from a cold and misty climate, Tackroy said. Thanks, he added to the landlord's back, as the landlord scampered indoors again. I suppose it must be tropical here, usually, he remarked as the door slammed. I wouldn't know. I can't feel heat or cold in the spirit. Is that stuff nice? Christopher nodded happily. He had already drained one tiny cup. It was dark, hot, and delicious. He pulled Tackroy's cup over and drank that in sips to make the taste last as long as possible. The round leather bottle smelled so offensive that it got in the way of the taste. Christopher put it on the floor out of the way. You can lift it, I see, and drink, Tackroy said, watching him. Your uncle told me to make quite sure, but I haven't any doubt myself. He said you lose things on the passage. That's because it's hard carrying things across the rocks, Christopher explained. I need both hands for climbing. Tackroy thought. Hmm, that explains the strap on the bottle. But there could be all sorts of other reasons. I'd love to find out. For instance, have you ever tried to bring back something alive? Like a mouse, Christopher suggested. I could put it in my pocket. A sudden, gleeful look came into Tackroy's face. He looked, Christopher thought, like a person about to be thoroughly naughty. Let's try it, he said. Let's see if you can bring back a small animal next. I'll persuade your uncle that we need to know that. I think I'll die of curiosity if we don't try it, even if it's the last thing you do for us. After that, Tackroy seemed to get more and more impatient. At last, he stood up in such a hurry that he stood right through the chair as if it wasn't there. Haven't you finished yet? Let's get going. Christopher regretfully stood the tiny cup on his face to get at the last drops. He picked up the round bottle and hung it around his neck by the strap. Then he jumped off the veranda and set off down the rutty road, full of eagerness to show Tackroy the town. Fungus grew like corals on all the porches. Tackroy would like that. Tackroy called after him. Hey, where are you off to? Christopher stopped and explained. No way, said Tackroy. It doesn't matter if the fungus is sky blue pink. I can't hold this trance much longer, and I want to make sure you get back too. This was disappointing. But when Christopher came close and peered at him, Tackroy did seem to be developing a faint, fluttery look, as if he might dissolve into the dark or turn into one of the moth things beating at the windows of the inn. Rather alarmed by this, Christopher put a hand on Tackroy's sleeve to hold him in place. For a moment, the arm hardly felt as if it was there, like the feathery balls of dust that grew under Christopher's bed. But after that first moment, it firmed up nicely. Tackroy's outline grew hard and black against the dark trees, and Tackroy himself stood very still. I do believe, he said, as if he did not believe it at all, that you've done something to fix me. What did you do? Hardened you up, Christopher said. You needed it so that we could go and look at the town. Come on. But Tackroy laughed and took a firm grip on Christopher's arm, so firm that Christopher was sorry he had hardened him. No, we'll see the fungus another time. Now I know you can do this too. It's going to be much easier. But I only contracted for an hour this trip. Come on. As they went back up the valley, Tackroy kept peering around. If it wasn't so dark, he said, I'm sure I'd be seeing this as a valley too. I can hear the stream. This is amazing. But it was clear that he could not see the place between. When they got to it, Tackroy went on walking as if he thought it was still the valley. When the wind blew the mist aside, 
he was not there any more. Christopher wondered whether to go back into Nine or on into another valley. But it did not seem such fun without company. So he let the place between push him back home. By the next morning, Christopher was heartily sick of the smell. It was more of a reek, really, from the leather bottle. He put it under his head, but it was still so bad that he had to get up and cover it with a pillow before he could get to sleep. When the last governess came in to tell him to get up, she found it at once by the smell. Dear heavens above, she said, dragging it out by its strap, would you credit this? I didn't believe even your uncle could ask for a whole bottle full of this stuff. Didn't he think of the danger? Christopher blinked up at her. He had never seen her so emotional. All her hidden prettiness had come out, and she was staring at the bottle as if she did not know whether to be angry or scared or pleased. What's in it? he said. Dragon's blood, said the last governess, and it's not even dried. I'm going to get this straight off to your uncle while you get dressed, or your mamma will throw fits. She hurried away with the bottle at arm's length, swinging on its strap. I think your uncle's going to be very pleased, she called over her shoulder. There was no doubt about that. A day later, a big parcel arrived for Christopher. The last governess brought it up to the schoolroom with some scissors and let him cut the string for himself, which added much to the excitement. Inside was a huge box of chocolates with a vast red bow and a picture of a boy blowing bubbles on the top. Chocolates were so rare in Christopher's life that he almost failed to notice the envelope tucked into the bow. It had a gold sovereign in it and a note from Uncle Rafe. Well done, it said. Next experiment in a week. Miss Bell will tell you when. Congratulations from your loving uncle. This so delighted Christopher that he let the last governess have first pick from the chocolates. I think, she said dryly as she picked the nutty kind that Christopher never liked, that your mamma would like to be offered one before too many are gone. Then she plucked the note out of Christopher's fingers and put it in the fire, as a hint that he was not to explain to mamma what he had done to earn the chocolates. Christopher prudently ate the first layer before he offered the box to Mamma. Oh dear, these are so bad for your teeth, Mamma said, while her fingers hovered over the strawberry and then the truffle. You do seem to have taken your uncle's fancy, and that's just as well, since I've had to put all my money in his hands. It'll be your money one day, she said, as her fingers closed on the fudge. Don't let my brother spoil him too much, she said to the last governess and I think you'd better take him to a dentist. Yes, madam, said the last governess, all meek and drab. It was clear that Mamma did not have the least suspicion what the chocolates were really about. Christopher was pleased to have been so faithful to Uncle Rafe's wishes, though he did wish Mamma had not chosen the fudge. The rest of the chocolates did not last quite the whole week, but they did take Christopher's mind off the excitement of the next experiment. In fact, when the last governess said calmly the next Friday, before bedtime, Your uncle wants you to go on another dream tonight. Christopher felt more businesslike than excited. You are to try to get to series ten, said the last governess, and meet the same man as before. Do you think you can do that? Easy, Christopher said loftily. I could do it standing on my head. "'Which is getting a little swelled,' remarked the last governess. "'Don't forget to brush your hair and clean your teeth, "'and don't get too confident. "'This is not really a game.' "'Christopher did honestly try not to feel too confident, "'but it was easy. "'He went out onto the path where he put on his muddy clothes "'and then climbed through the place between, looking for Tackroy.' The only difficulty was that the valleys were not arranged in the right order. Number ten was not next one on from nine, but quite a way lower down and further on. Christopher almost thought he was not going to find it. But at length 
he slid down a long slope of yellowish scree and saw Tacroy shining wetly through the mist as he crouched uncomfortably on the valley's lip. He held out a dripping arm to Christopher. Lord, he said, I thought you were never coming. Firm me up, will you? I'm fading back already. The latest girl is nothing like so effective. Christopher took hold of Tacroy's cold, woolly-feeling hand. Tacroy began firming up at once. Soon he was hard and wet, and as solid as Christopher, and very pleased about it, too. This was the part your uncle found hardest to believe, he said, while they climbed into the valley. But I swore to him that I'd be able to see... Oh, um... What do you see, Christopher? It's the anywhere where I got my bells, Christopher said, smiling around the steep green slopes. He remembered it perfectly. This anywhere had a particular twist to the stream halfway down. But there was something new here, a sort of mistiness just beside the path. What's that? he asked, forgetting that Tacroy could not see the valley. But Tacroy evidently could see the valley now he was firmed up. He stared at the mistiness with his eyes ruefully wrinkled. Part of your uncle's experiment that doesn't seem to have worked, he said. It's supposed to be a horseless carriage. He was trying to send it through to meet us. Do you think you can firm that up too? Christopher went to the mistiness and tried to put his hand on it. But the thing did not seem to be there enough for him to touch. His hand just went through. Never mind, said Tacroy. Your uncle will just have to think again. And the carriage was only one of three experiments tonight. He insisted that Christopher ride a big ten in the dirt of the path, and then they set off down the valley. If the carriage had worked, Tacroy explained, we'd have tried for something bulky. As it is, I get my way and we try for an animal. Lordy, I'm glad you came when you did. I was almost as bad as that carriage. It's all that girl's fault. The lovely young lady with the harp, asked Christopher. Alas, no, Tacroy said regretfully. She took a fit when you firmed me up last time. It seems my body there in London went down to a thread of mist and she thought I was a goner. Screamed and broke our harp strings. Left as soon as I came back. She said she wasn't paid to harbour ghosts, pointed out that her contract was only for one trance and refused to come back for twice the money. Pity. I hope she was made of sterner stuff. She reminded me very much of another young lady with a harp who was once the light of my life. For a short while he looked as sad as someone with such a merry face could. Then he smiled. But I couldn't ask either of them to share my garret, he said. So it's probably just as well. Did you need to get another one? Christopher asked. I can't do without, unfortunately, unlike you, Tacroy said. A professional spirit traveller has to have another medium to keep him anchored. Music's the best way, and to call him back in case of trouble, and keep him warm, and make sure he's not interrupted by tradesmen with bills and so forth. So your uncle found this new girl in a bit of a hurry. She's stern stuff, all right. Voice like a hatchet. Plays the flute like someone using wet chalk on a blackboard. Tacroy shuddered slightly. I can hear it faintly all the time if I listen. Christopher could hear a squealing noise too, but he thought it was probably the pipes of the snake charmers who sat in rows against the city wall in this anywhere. They could see the city now. It was very hot here, far hotter than nine. The high, muddy-looking walls and the strange-shaped domes above them quivered in the heat, like things under water. Sandy dust blew up in clouds, almost hiding the dirty white row of old men squatting in front of baskets blowing into pipes. Christopher looked nervously at the fat snakes, each one swaying upright in its basket. Tacroy laughed. Don't worry, your uncle doesn't want a snake any more than you do. The city had a towering but narrow gate. By the time they reached it, both were covered in sandy dust, and Christopher was sweating through it in trickles. Tacroy seemed enviably cool. Inside the walls it was even hotter. This was the one drawback to a thoroughly nice anywhere. 
The shady edges of the streets were crowded with people and goats and makeshift stalls under coloured umbrellas, so that Christopher was forced to walk with Tackroy down the blinding stripe of sun in the middle. Everyone shouted and chattered cheerfully. The air was thick with strange smells, the bleating of goats, the squawks of chickens, and strange clinking music. All the colours were bright, and brightest of all were the small gilded dollhouse things at the corners of streets. These were always heaped with flowers and dishes of food. Christopher thought they must belong to very small gods. A lady, under an electric blue umbrella, gave him some of the sweetmeat she was selling. It was like a crisp bird's nest soaked in honey. Christopher gave some to Tackroy, but Tackroy said he could only taste it the way you tasted food in dreams, even when Christopher firmed him up again. "'Does Uncle Rafe want me to fetch a goat?' Christopher asked, licking honey from his fingers. "'We'd have tried if the carriage had worked,' Tackroy said. "'But what your uncle's really hoping for is a cat from one of the temples. "'We have to find the Temple of Asheth.' Christopher led the way to the big square where all the large houses for gods were. The man with the yellow umbrella was still there, on the steps of the largest temple. "'Ah, yes, that's it,' Tackroy said. But when Christopher set off, hopefully, to talk to the man with the yellow umbrella again, Tackroy said, "'No, I think our best bet is to get in around the side somewhere.' They found their way down narrow side alleys that ran all around the temple. There were no other doors to the temple at all, nor did it have any windows. The walls were high and muddy-looking and totally blank, except for wicked spikes on the top. Tackroy stopped quite cheerfully in a baking alley, where someone had thrown away a cartload of old cabbages, and looked up at the spikes. The ends of flowering creepers were twined among the spikes from the other side of the wall. "'This looks promising,' he said, and leaned against the wall. His cheerful look vanished. For a moment he looked frustrated and rather annoyed. "'Here's a turn-up,' he said. "'You've made me too solid to get through, darn it!' He thought about it and shrugged. This was supposed to be experiment three, anyway. Your uncle thought that if you could broach away between the worlds, you could probably pass through a wall, too. Are you game to try? Do you think you can get in and pick up a cat without me? Tackroy seemed very nervous and worried about it. Christopher looked at the frowning wall and thought that it was probably impossible. I can try, he said, and largely to console Tackroy, he stepped up against the hot stones of the wall and tried to push himself through them. At first it was impossible, but after a moment he found that if he turned himself sort of sideways in a peculiar way, he began to sink into the stones. He turned and smiled encouragingly at Tackroy's worried face. I'll be back in a minute. I don't like letting you go on your own, Tackroy was saying when there came a noise like shluck, and Christopher found himself on the other side of the wall, all mixed up in creepers. For a second he was blinded in the sun there. He could see and hear and feel that things were moving all over the yard in front of him, rushing away from him in a stealthy, blurred way that had him almost paralysed with terror. Snakes, he thought, and blinked and squinted and blinked again, trying to see them properly. They were only cats, running away from the noise he had made coming through the wall. Most of them were well out of reach by the time he could see. Some had climbed high up the creepers, and the rest had bolted for the various dark archways around the yard. But one white cat was slower than the others, and was left trotting uncertainly and heavily across the harsh shadow in one corner. That was the one to get. Christopher set off after it. By the time he had torn himself free of the creepers, the white cat had taken fright. It ran. Christopher ran after it, through an archway hung with more creepers, across another shadier yard, and then through a doorway with a curtain instead of a door. The cat slipped around the curtain. Christopher flung the curtain aside and dived after it, only to find it was so dark beyond that he was once more blinded. "'Who are you?' said a voice from the darkness. 
It sounded surprised and haughty. You're not supposed to be here. Who are you? Christopher said cautiously, wishing he could see something beside blue and green dazzle. I'm the goddess, of course, said the voice, the living Asheth. What are you doing here? I'm not supposed to see anyone but priestesses until the day of festival. I only came to get a cat, said Christopher. I'll go away when I have. You're not allowed to, said the goddess. Cats are sacred to Asheth. Besides, if it's Bethy you're after, she's mine, and she's going to have kittens again. Christopher's eyes were adjusting. If he peered hard at the corner where the voice came from, he could see someone about the same size as he was sitting on what seemed to be a pile of cushions, and pick out the white hump of the cat clutched in the person's arms. He took a step forward to see better. Stay where you are," said the goddess, "or I'll call down fire to blast you." Christopher, much to his surprise, found he could not move from the spot. He shuffled his feet to make sure. It was as if his bare soles were fastened to the tiles with strong, rubbery glue. While he shuffled, his eyes started working properly. The goddess was a girl with a round, ordinary face and long, mouse-coloured hair. She was wearing a sleeveless, rust-brown robe. And rather a lot of turquoise jewellery, including at least twenty bracelets and a little turquoise-studded coronet. She looked a bit younger than he was, much too young to be able to fasten someone's feet to the floor. Christopher was impressed. How did you do it? He said. The goddess shrugged. The power of the living Asheth, she said. I was chosen from among all the other applicants because I'm the best vessel for her power. Asheth picked me out by giving me the mark of a cat on my foot. Look. She tipped herself sideways on her cushions, and stretched one bare foot with an anklet around it towards Christopher. It had a big purple birthmark on the sole. Christopher did not think it looked much like a cat, even when he screwed his eyes up so much that he felt like Tackroy. You don't believe me, the goddess said rather accusingly. I don't know, said Christopher. I've never met a goddess before. What do you do? I stay in the temple unseen, except for one day every year when I ride through the city and bless it," said the goddess. Christopher thought that this did not sound very interesting, but before he could say so, the goddess added, "It's not much fun actually, but that's the way things are when you're honoured like I am. The living Asheth always has to be a young girl, you see." Do you stop being Asheth when you grow up? Then, Christopher asked. The goddess frowned. Clearly, she was not sure. Well, the living Asheth never is grown up, so I suppose so. They haven't said. Her round, solemn face brightened up. That's something to look forward to, eh, Bethy? She said, stroking the white cat. If I can't have that cat, will you let me have another one? Christopher asked. It depends. Said the goddess, "I don't think I'm allowed to give them away. What do you want it for?" My uncle wants one. Christopher explained, "We're doing an experiment to see if I can fetch a live animal from your anywhere to ours. Yours is ten, and ours is twelve, and it's quite difficult climbing across the place between. So if you do let me have a cat, could you lend me a basket too, please?" The goddess considered. "How many anywheres are there?" she asked. In a testing kind of way, hundreds," said Christopher. "But Tackroy thinks there's only twelve. The priestesses say there are twelve known otherwheres," the goddess said, nodding. "But Mother Proudfoot is fairly sure there are many more than that." "Yes, and how did you get into the temple?" "Through the wall," said Christopher. "Nobody saw me." "Then you could get in and out again if you wanted to," said the goddess. Easy," said Christopher. "Good," said the goddess. She dumped the white cat in the cushions and sprang to her feet with a smart jangle and clack from all her jewellery. "I'll swap you a cat," she said. "But first, you must swear by the goddess to come back and bring me what I want in exchange, or I'll keep your feet stuck to the floor and shout for the arm of Asher to come and kill you." "What do you want in exchange?" 
asked Christopher. Swear first, said the goddess. I swear, said Christopher. But that was not enough. The goddess hooked her thumbs into her jewelled sash and stared stonily. She was actually a little shorter than Christopher, but that did not make the stare any less impressive. I swear by the goddess that I'll come back with what you want in exchange for the cat. Will that do? said Christopher. Now what do you want? Books to read, said the goddess. I'm bored, she explained. She did not say it in a whine, but in a brisk way that made Christopher see it was true. Aren't there any books here? he said. Hundreds, the goddess said gloomily. But they're all educational or holy, and the living goddess isn't allowed to touch anything in this world outside the temple. Anything in this world. Do you understand? Christopher nodded. He understood perfectly. Which cat can I have? Throgmorton, said the goddess. Upon that word, Christopher's feet came loose from the tiles. He was able to walk beside the goddess as she lifted the curtain from the doorway and went out into the shady yard. I don't mind you taking Throgmorton, she said. He smells, and he scratches, and he bullies all the other cats. I hate him. But we'll have to be quick about catching him. The priestesses will be waking up from siesta quite soon. Just a moment. She dashed aside into an archway in a clash of anklets that made Christopher jump. She whirled back almost at once, a whirl of rusty robe, flying girdle, and swirling mouse-coloured hair. She was carrying a basket with a lid. This should do, she said. The lid has a good strong fastening. She led the way through the creeper-hung archway into the courtyard with the blinding sunlight. He's usually lording it over the other cat somewhere here, she said. Yes, there he is. That's him in the corner. Throgmorton was ginger. He was at that moment glaring at a black and white female cat who had lowered herself into a miserable crouch while she tried to back humbly away. Throgmorton swaggered towards her, lashing a stripy snake-like tail, until the black and white cat's nerve broke and she bolted. Then he turned to see what Christopher and the goddess wanted. Isn't he horrible? said the goddess. She thrust the basket at Christopher. Hold it open and shut the lid down quick after I've got him into it. Throgmorton was, Christopher had to admit, a truly unpleasant cat. His yellow eyes stared at them with a blank and insolent leer, and there was something about the set of his ears, one higher than the other, which told Christopher that Throgmorton would attack viciously anything that got in his way. This being so, he was puzzled that Throgmorton should remind him remarkably much of Uncle Rafe. He supposed it must be the gingerness. At this moment, Throgmorton sensed they were after him. His back arched incredulously. Then he fairly levitated up into the creepers on the wall, racing and scrambling higher and higher until he was far above their heads. No, you don't, said the goddess. And Throgmorton's arched ginger body came flying out of the creepers like a furry orange boomerang and landed slap in the basket. Christopher was deeply impressed so impressed that he was a bit slow getting the lid down. Throgmorton came pouring out over the edge of the basket again in an instant ginger stream. The goddess seized him and crammed him back, whereupon a large number of flailing ginger legs, at least seven to Christopher's bemused eyes, clawed hold of her bracelets and her robe and her legs under the robe and tore pieces off them. Christopher waited, and aimed for an instant when one of Throgmorton's heads, he seemed to have at least three, each with more fangs than seemed possible, came into range. Then he banged the basket lid on it, hard. Throgmorton, for the blink of an eye, became an ordinary dazed cat instead of a fighting devil. The goddess shook him off into the basket. Christopher slapped the lid on. 
a huge ginger paw loaded with long pink razors at once oozed itself out of the latch hole and tore several strips off Christopher while he fastened the basket. Thanks, he said, sucking his wounds. I'm glad to see the back of him, said the goddess, licking a slash on her arm and mopping blood off her leg with her torn robe. A melodious voice called from the creeper hung archway. Goddess, dear, where are you? I have to go, whispered the goddess. Don't forget the books. You swore to a swap. Coming, she called, and went running back to the archway. Clash, tink, clash, tink. Christopher turned quickly to the wall and tried to go through it. And he could not. No matter how he tried turning that peculiar sideways way, it would not work. He knew it was Throgmorton. Holding a live cat snarling in a basket made him part of this anywhere, and he had to obey its usual rules. What was he to do? More melodious voices were calling to the goddess in the distance, and he could see people moving inside at least two more of the archways around the yard. He never really considered putting the basket down. Uncle Rafe wanted this cat. Christopher ran for it instead, sprinting for the nearest archway that seemed to be empty. Unfortunately, the jigging of the basket assured Throgmorton that he was certainly being kidnapped. He protested about it at the top of his voice, and Christopher would never have believed that a mere cat could make such a powerful noise. Throgmorton's voice filled the dark passages beyond the archway, wailing, throbbing, rising to a shriek like a dying vampire's, and then falling to a strong, curdled, contralto howl. Then it went up to a shriek again. Before Christopher had run twenty yards, there were shouts behind him, and the slap of sandals and the thumping of bare feet. He ran faster than ever, twisting into a new passage whenever he came to one, and sprinting down that, but all the time Throgmorton kept up his yells of protest from the basket, showing the pursuers exactly where to follow. Worse, he fetched more. There were twice the number of shouts and thumping feet behind by the time Christopher saw daylight ahead. He burst out into it, followed by a jostling mob. And it was not really daylight, but a huge, confusing temple full of worshippers and statues and fat painted pillars. The daylight was coming from great open doors a hundred yards away. Christopher could see the man with the yellow umbrella outlined beyond the doors and knew exactly where he was. He dashed for the doors, dodging pillars and sprinting around people praying. <coughs> Howled Throgmorton from the basket in his hand. Stop, thief! screamed the people chasing him. Arm of Asheth! Christopher saw a man in a silver mask, or maybe a woman, a silver masked person anyway, standing on a flight of steps, carefully aiming a spear at him. He tried to dodge, but there was no time, or the spear followed him somehow. It crashed into his chest with a jolting thud. Things seemed to go very slowly then. Christopher stood still clutching the howling basket, and stared disbelievingly at the shaft of the spear sticking out of his chest through his dirty shirt. He saw it in tremendous detail. It was made of beautifully polished brown wood, with words and pictures carved along it. About halfway up was a shiny silver hand grip, which had designs that were almost rubbed out with wear. A few drops of blood were coming out where the wood met his shirt. The spearhead must be buried deep inside him. He looked up to see the masked person advancing triumphantly towards him. Beyond, in the doorway, Tacroy must have been fetched by the noise. He was standing frozen there, staring in horror. Falteringly, Christopher put out his free hand and took hold of the spear by the hand grip to pull it out. And everything stopped with a bump.
It was early morning. Christopher realised that what had woken him was angry cat noises from the basket lying on its side in the middle of the floor. Throgmorton wanted out. Instantly. Christopher sat up, beaming with triumph, because he had proved he could bring a live animal from an anywhere. Then he remembered he had a spear sticking out of his chest. He looked down. There was no sign of a spear. There was no blood. Nothing hurt. He felt his chest. Then he undid his pyjamas and looked. Incredibly, he saw only smooth, pale skin, without a sign of a wound. He was all right. The anywheres were really only a kind of dream after all. He laughed. Wow! Throgmorton said angrily, making the basket roll about. Christopher supposed he had better let the beast out. Remembering those spiked, tearing claws, he stood up on his bed and unhitched the heavy bar that held the curtains. It was hard to manoeuvre with the curtains hanging from it and sliding about, but Christopher rather thought he might need the curtains to shield him from Throgmorton's rage, so he kept them in a bunch in front of him. After a bit of swaying and prodding, he managed to get the brass point at the end of the curtain bar under the latch of the lid and open the basket. The cat sounds stopped. Throgmorton seemed to have decided that this was a trick. Christopher waited, gently bouncing on his bed and clutching the bar and the bundle of curtain, for Throgmorton to attack. But nothing happened. Christopher leaned forward cautiously until he could see into the basket. It contained a round ginger bundle, gently moving up and down. Throgmorton, disdaining freedom now he had it, had curled up and gone to sleep. All right, then, said Christopher. Be like that. With a bit of a struggle, he hitched the curtain pole back on its supports again and went to sleep himself. Next time he woke, Throgmorton was exploring the room. Christopher lay on his back and warily watched Throgmorton jump from one piece of furniture to another all around the room. As far as he could tell, Throgmorton was not angry any more. He seemed simply full of curiosity. Or maybe, Christopher thought, as Throgmorton gathered himself and jumped from the top of the wardrobe to the curtain pole, Throgmorton had a bet on with himself that he could get all around the night nursery without touching the floor. As Throgmorton began scrambling along the pole, hanging onto it and the curtains with those remarkable claws of his, Christopher was sure of it. What happened then was definitely not Throgmorton's fault. Christopher knew it was his own fault for not putting the curtain pole back properly. The end furthest from Throgmorton and nearest Christopher came loose and plunged down like a harpoon, with the curtains rattling along it and Throgmorton hanging on frantically. For an instant, Christopher had Throgmorton's terror-stricken eyes glaring into his own as Throgmorton rode the pole down. Then the brass end hit the middle of Christopher's chest. It went in like the spear. It was not sharp, and it was not heavy, but it went right into him all the same. Throgmorton landed on his stomach an instant later, all claws and panic. Christopher thought he screamed. Anyway, either he or Throgmorton made enough noise to fetch the last governess running. The last thing Christopher saw for the time being was the last governess in her white nightdress, grey with horror, moving her hands in quick, peculiar gestures and gabbling very odd words. He woke up a long time later, in the afternoon by the light, very sore in front, and not too sure of very much, to hear Uncle Rafe's voice. This is a damned nuisance, Effie, just when things were looking so promising. Is he going to be all right? I think so, the last governess replied. The two of them were standing by Christopher's bed. I got there in time to say a staunching spell, and it seems to be healing. 
while Christopher was thinking, funny, I didn't know she was a witch, she went on, I haven't dared breathe a word to your sister. Don't, said Uncle Rafe. She has her plans for him cut and dried, and she'll put a stop to mine if she finds out. Drat that cat! I've got things set up all over the related worlds on the strength of that first run, and I don't want to cancel them. You think he'll recover? In time, said the last governess. There's a strong spell in the dressing. Then I shall have to postpone everything, Uncle Rafe said, not sounding at all pleased. At least we've got the cat. Where's the thing got to? Under the bed. I tried to fetch it out, but I just got scratched for my pains, said the last governess. Women, said Uncle Rafe. I'll get it. Christopher heard his knees thump on the floor. His voice came up from underneath. Here, nice pussy. Come here, pussy. There was a very serious outbreak of cat noises. Uncle Rafe's knees went thumping away backwards, and his voice said quite a string of bad words. The creature's a perfect devil, he added. It's torn lumps off me. Then his voice came from higher up and further away. Don't let it get away. Put a holding spell on this room until I get back. Where are you going? the last governess asked. To fetch some thick leather gloves and a vet, Uncle Rafe said from by the door. That's an Arsheth Temple cat. It's almost priceless. Wizards will pay five hundred pounds just for an inch of its guts or one of its claws. Its eyes will fetch several thousand pounds each, so make sure you set a good tight spell. It may take me an hour or so to find a vet. There was silence after that. Christopher dozed. He woke up feeling so much better that he sat up and took a look at his wound. The last governess had efficiently covered it with smooth white bandage. Christopher peered down inside it with great interest. The wound was a round red hole, much smaller than he expected. It hardly hurt at all. While he wondered how to find out how deep it was, there was a piercing wail from the window sill behind him. He looked around. The window was open. The last governess had a passion for fresh air, and Throgmorton was crouched on the sill beside it, glaring appealingly. When he saw Christopher was looking, Throgmorton put out one of his razor-loaded paws and scraped it down the space between the window and the frame. The empty air made a sound like someone scratching a blackboard. Wong! Throgmorton commanded. Christopher wondered why Throgmorton should think he was on his side. One way and another, Throgmorton had half killed him. Wong! Throgmorton asked piteously. On the other hand, Christopher thought, none of the half killing had been Throgmorton's fault. And though Throgmorton was probably the ugliest and most vicious cat in any anywhere, it did not seem fair to kidnap him and drag him to a strange world, and then let him be sold to wizards parcel by parcel. All right, he said, and climbed out of bed. Throgmorton stood up eagerly with his thin ginger snake of a tail straight up behind. Yes, but I'm not sure how to break spells, Christopher said, approaching very cautiously. Throgmorton backed away and made no attempt to scratch. Christopher put his hand out to the open part of the window. The empty space felt rubbery and gave when he pressed it, but he could not put his hand through even if he shoved it hard. So he did the only thing he could think of and opened the window wider. He felt the spell tear like a rather tough cobweb. Wong! Throgmorton uttered appreciatively. Then he was off. Christopher watched him gallop down a slanting drain and levitate to a windowsill when the drain stopped. From there, it was an easy jump to the top of a bay window and then to the ground. Throgmorton's ginger shape went trotting away into the bushes and squeezed under the next door fence, already with the air of looking for birds to kill and other cats to bully. Christopher put the window carefully back the way it had been and got back to bed. When he woke up next, Mamma was outside the door, saying anxiously, How is he? 
I hope it's not infectious. Not in the least, madam, said the last governess. So Mamma came in, filling the room with her scents, which was just as well since Throgmorton had left his own penetrating odour under the bed, and looked at Christopher. He seems a bit pale, she said. Do we need a doctor? I saw to all that, madam, said the last governess. Thank you, said Mamma. Make sure it doesn't interrupt his education. When Mamma had gone, the last governess fetched her umbrella and poked it under the bed and behind the furniture, looking for Throgmorton. Where has it got to? she said, climbing up to jab at the space on top of the wardrobe. I don't know, Christopher said truthfully, since he knew Throgmorton would be many streets away by now. He was here before I went to sleep. It's vanished, said the last governess. A cat can't just vanish. Christopher said experimentally, He was an Asheth Temple cat. True, said the last governess. They are wildly magic, by all accounts. But your uncle's not going to be at all pleased to find it gone. This made Christopher feel decidedly guilty. He could not go back to sleep, and when, about an hour later, he heard brisk, heavy feet approaching the door, he sat up at once, wondering what he was going to say to Uncle Rafe. But the man who came in was not Uncle Rafe. He was a total stranger. No, it was Papa! Christopher recognised the black whiskers. Papa's face was fairly familiar, too, because it was quite like his own, except for the whiskers, and a solemn, anxious look. Christopher was astonished, because he had somehow thought, without anyone ever having exactly said so, that Papa had left the house in disgrace after whatever went wrong with the money. "'Are you all right, son?' Papa said. And the hurried, worried way he spoke, and the way he looked around nervously at the door, told Christopher that Papa had indeed left the house, and did not want to be found here. This made it plain that Papa had come specially to see Christopher, which astonished Christopher even more. "'I'm quite well, thank you,' Christopher said politely. He had not the least idea how to talk to Papa face to face. Politeness seemed safest. "'Are you sure?' Papa asked, staring attentively at him. "'The life spell I have for you showed... "'In fact, it stopped, as if you were... Um, "'Frankly, I thought you might be dead.' "'Christopher was more astonished still. "'Oh, no, I'm feeling much better now,' he said. "'Thank God for that,' said Papa. "'I must have made an error setting the spell. "'It seems a habit with me just now.' "'but I have drawn up your horoscope, too, and checked it several times, "'and I must warn you that the next year and a half "'will be a time of acute danger for you, my son. "'You must be very careful.' "'Yes,' said Christopher, "'I will.' "'He meant it. "'He could still see the curtain rod coming down if he shut his eyes, "'and he had to keep trying not to think at all "'of the way the spear had stuck out of him. "'Papa leaned a little closer and looked furtively at the door again. That brother of your mamma's, Rafe Argent, I hear he's managing your mamma's affairs, he said. Try to have as little to do with him as you can, my son. He is not a nice person to know. And having said that, Papa patted Christopher's shoulder and hurried away. Christopher was quite relieved. One way and another, Papa had made him very uncomfortable. Now he was even more worried about what he would say to Uncle Rafe. But to his great relief, the last governess told him that Uncle Rafe was not coming. He said that he was too annoyed about losing Throgmorton to make a good sick visitor. Christopher sighed thankfully and settled down to enjoy being an invalid. He drew pictures, he ate grapes, he read books, and he spun out his illness as long as he could. This was not easy. The next morning his wound was only a round, itchy scab, and on the third day it was hardly there at all. On the fourth day the last governess made him get up and have lessons as usual, but it had been lovely while it lasted. On the day after that the last governess said, Your uncle wants to try another experiment tomorrow. 
He wants you to meet the man at Series 8 this time. Do you think you feel well enough? Christopher felt perfectly well, and provided nobody wanted him to go near Series 10 again, he was quite willing to go on another dream. Series 8 turned out to be the bleak and stony anywhere up above 9. Christopher had not cared for it much when he had explored it on his own, but Tacroy was so glad to see him that it would have made up for a far worse place. "'Am I glad to see you?' Tacroy said while Christopher was firming him up. "'I'd resign myself to being the cause of your death. I could kick myself for persuading your uncle to get you to fetch an animal. Everyone knows living creatures cause all sorts of problems, and I've told him we're never going to try that again. Are you really all right?' Fine, said Christopher. My chest was smooth when I woke up. In fact, the funny thing about both accidents was that Throgmorton's scratches had taken twice as long to heal as either wound. But Tacroy seemed to find this so hard to believe and to be so full of self-blame that Christopher got embarrassed and changed the subject. Have you still got the young lady who's stern stuff? Sterner than ever, Tacroy said, becoming much more cheerful at once. The wretched girl setting my teeth on edge with that flute at this moment. Take a look down the valley. Your uncle's been busy since you... since your accident. Uncle Rafe had perfected the horseless carriage. It was sitting on the sparse, stony grass beside the stream as firm as anything, though it looked more like a rough wooden sled than any kind of carriage. Something had been done so that Tacroy was able to take hold of the rope fastened to the front. When he pulled, the carriage came gliding down the valley after him, without really touching the ground. "'It's supposed to return to London with me when I go back to my garret,' he explained. "'I know that doesn't seem likely, but your uncle swears he's got it right this time. "'The question is, will it go back with a load on it, or will the load stay behind? "'That's what tonight's experiment is to find out.' Christopher had to help Tacroy haul the sled up the long, stony trail beyond the valley. Tacroy was never quite firm enough to give a good pull. At length they came to a bleak stone farm crouched halfway up the hill, where a group of thick-armed silent women were waiting in the yard beside a heap of packages carefully wrapped in oiled silk. The packages smelled odd, but that smell was drowned by the thick garlic breath from the women. As soon as the sled came to a stop, garlic rolled out in waves as the women picked up the packages and tried to load them on the sled. The parcels dropped straight through it and fell on the ground. No good, said Tacroy. I thought you were warned. Let Christopher do it. It was hard work. The women watched untrustingly while Christopher loaded the parcels and tied them in place with rope. Tacroy tried to help but he was not firm enough, and his hands went through the parcels. Christopher got tired and cold in the strong wind. When one of the women gave a stern, friendly smile and asked him if he would like to come indoors for a drink, he said yes, gladly. "'Not today, thank you,' Tacroy said. "'This thing's still experimental, and we're not sure how long the spells will hold. We'd better get back.' He could see Christopher was disappointed. As they towed the sled away downhill, he said, I don't blame you. Call this just a business trip. Your uncle aims to get this carriage corrected by the way it performs tonight. My devout hope is that he can make it firm enough to be loaded by the people who bring the load, and then we can count you out of it altogether. But I like helping, Christopher protested. Besides, how would you pull it if I'm not there to firm you up? There is that, Tacroy said. He thought about it while they got to the bottom of the hill, and he started plodding up the valley with the rope straining over his shoulder. "'There's something I must say to you,' he panted. "'Are you learning magic at all?' "'I don't think so,' Christopher said. "'Well, you should be,' Tacroy panted. "'You must have the strongest talent I've ever encountered. "'Ask your mother to let you have lessons.' "'I think Mama wants me to be a missionary,' Christopher said." Tacroy screwed his eyes up over that. Are you sure? Might you have misheard her? Wouldn't the word be magician? No, said Christopher. She says I'm to go into society. 
Ah, society, Tackroy panted wistfully. I have dreams of myself in society, looking handsome in a velvet suit and surrounded by young ladies playing harps. Do missionaries wear velvet suits? asked Christopher. Or do you mean heaven? Tackroy looked up at the stormy grey sky. I don't think this conversation is getting anywhere, he remarked to it. Try again. Your uncle tells me you're going away to school soon. If it's any kind of a decent school, they should teach you magic as an extra. Promise me that you'll ask to be allowed to take it. All right, said Christopher. The mention of school gave him a jab of nerves somewhere deep in his stomach. What are schools like? Full of children, said Tackroy. I won't prejudice you. By this time, he had laboured his way to the top of the valley, where the mists of the place between were swirling in front of them. Now comes the tricky part, he said. Your uncle thought this thing might have more chance of arriving with its load if you gave it a push as I leave. But before I go, next time you find yourself in a heathen temple and they start chasing you, drop everything and get out through the nearest wall, understand? By the looks of things, I'll be seeing you in a week or so. Christopher put his shoulder against the back of the carriage and shoved as Tackroy stepped off into the mist, holding the rope. The carriage tilted and slid downwards after him. As soon as it was in the mists, it looked all light and papery, like a kite. And like a kite, it plunged and wallowed down, out of sight. Christopher climbed back home thoughtfully. It shook him to find he had been in the anywhere where the heathens lived without knowing it. He had been right to be nervous of heathens. Nothing, he thought, would possess him to go back to series ten now. And he did wish that Mamma had not decided that he should be a missionary. From then on, Uncle Rafe arranged a new experiment every week. He had, Tackroy said, been very pleased because the carriage and the packages had arrived in Tackroy's garret with no hitch at all. Two wizards and a sorcerer had refined the spell on it until it could stay in another anywhere for up to a day. The experiments became much more fun. Tackroy and Christopher would tow the carriage to the place where the load was waiting, always carefully wrapped in packages the right size for Christopher to handle. After Christopher had loaded them, he and Tackroy would go exploring. Tackroy insisted on the exploring. It's his perks, he explained to the people with the packages. We'll be back in an hour or so. In series one, they went and looked at the amazing ring trains, where the rings were on pylons high above the ground and miles apart, and the trains went hurtling through them with a noise like the sky tearing, without even touching the rings. In series two, they wandered a maze of bridges over a tangle of rivers and looked down at giant eels resting their chins on sandbars, while even stranger creatures grunted and stirred in the mud under the bridges. Christopher suspected that Tackroy enjoyed exploring as much as he did, he was always cheerful during this part. It makes a change from sloping ceilings and peeling walls. I don't get out of London very much, Tackroy confessed while he was advising Christopher how to build a better sandcastle on the seashore in Series 5. Series 5 turned out to be the anywhere where Christopher had met the silly ladies. It was all islands. This is better than a bank holiday at Brighton any day, Tackroy said looking out across the bright blue crashing waves. Almost as good as an afternoon's cricket. I wish I could afford to get away more. Have you lost all your money, then? Christopher asked sympathetically. I never had any money to lose, Tackroy said. I was a foundling child. Christopher did not ask any more just then, because he was busy hoping that the mermaids would appear the way they used to. But though he looked and waited... Not a single mermaid came. He went back to the subject the following week in Series 7. As they followed a gypsy-looking man who was guiding them to see the great glacier, he asked Tackroy what it meant to be a foundling child. 
It means someone found me, Tackroy said cheerfully. The someone in my case was a very agreeable and very devout sea captain who picked me up as a baby on an island somewhere. He said the Lord had sent me. I don't know who my parents were. Christopher was impressed. Is that why you're always so cheerful? Tackroy laughed. I'm mostly cheerful, he said. But today I feel particularly good because I've got rid of the flute-playing girl at last. Your uncle's found me a nice grandmotherly person who plays the violin quite well. And maybe it's that, or maybe it's your influence, but I feel firmer with every step. Christopher looked at him, walking ahead along the mountain path. Tackroy looked as hard as the rocks towering on one side, and as real as the gypsy-looking man striding ahead of them both. I think you're getting better at it, he said. Could be, said Tackroy. I think you've raised my standards. And yet, do you know, young Christopher, until you came along, I was considered the best spirit traveller in the country. Here the gypsy man shouted and waved to them to come and look at the glacier. It sat above them in the rocks in a huge, dirty white V. Christopher did not think much of it. He could see it was mostly just dirty old snow, though it was certainly very big. Its giant icy lip hung over them, almost transparent grey, and water dribbled and poured off it. Series 7 was a strange world, all mountains and snow, but surprisingly hot, too. Where the water poured off the glacier, the heat had caused a great growth of strident green ferns and flowing tropical trees. Violent green moss grew scarlet cups as big as hats, all dewed with water. It was like looking at the North Pole and the equator at once. The three of them seemed tiny beneath it. Impressive, said Tackroy. I know two people who are like this thing. One of them is your uncle. Christopher thought that was a silly thing to say. Uncle Rafe was nothing like the giant glacier. He was annoyed with Tackroy all the following week. But he relented when the last governor suddenly presented him with a heap of new clothes, all sturdy and practical things. You're to wear these when you go on the next experiment, she said. Your uncle's man has been making a fuss. He says you always wear rags and your teeth were chattering in the snow last time. We don't want you ill, do we? Christopher never noticed being cold, but he was grateful to Tackroy. His old clothes had got so much too small that they got in the way when he climbed through the place between. He decided he liked Tackroy after all. I say, he said, as he loaded packages in a huge metal shed in Series 4, can I come and visit you in your garret? We live in London too. You live in quite a different part, Tackroy said hastily. You wouldn't like the area my garret's in at all. Christopher protested that this didn't matter. He wanted to see Tackroy in the flesh, and he was very curious to see the garret. But Tackroy kept making excuses. Christopher kept on asking, at least twice every experiment, until they went to Bleak and Stony Series 8 again, where Christopher was exceedingly glad of his warm clothes. There, while Christopher stood over the farmhouse fire warming his fingers around a mug of bitter malty tea, gratitude to Tackroy made him say yet again, Oh, please, can't I visit you in your garret? Oh, do stow it, Christopher, Tackroy said, sounding rather tired of it all. I'd invite you like a shot, but your uncle made a condition that you only see me like this while we're on an experiment. If I told you where I live, I'd lose this job. It's as simple as that. I could go round all the garrets, Christopher suggested cunningly, and shout Tackroy and ask people until I found you. You could not, said Tackroy. You'd draw a complete blank if you tried. Tackroy is my spirit name. I have quite a different name in the flesh. Christopher had to give in and accept it, though he did not understand in the least. Meanwhile, the time when he was to go to school was suddenly almost there. Christopher tried carefully not to think of it, but it was hard to forget when he had to spend such a lot of time trying on new clothes. The last governess sewed name tapes 
C. Chant on the clothes and packed them in a shiny black tin trunk, also labelled C. Chant in bold white letters. This trunk was shortly taken away by a carrier whose thick arms reminded Christopher of the women in Series 8, and the same carrier took away all Mama's trunks too. Only hers were addressed to Barden Barden, while Christopher's said, Penge School, Surrey. The day after that, Mama left for Barden Barden. She came to say goodbye to Christopher, dabbing her eyes with a blue lace handkerchief that matched her travelling suit. "'Remember to be good and learn a lot,' she said. "'And don't forget your mamma wants to be very proud of you when you grow up.' She put her scented cheek down for Christopher to kiss, and said to the last governess, "'Mind you take him to the dentist now?' "'I won't forget, madam,' the last governess said in her dreariest way. Somehow her prettiness never seemed to come out in front of mamma. Christopher did not enjoy the dentist.' After banging and scraping around Christopher's teeth as if he was trying to make them all fall out, the dentist made a long speech about how crooked and out of place they were, until Christopher began to think of himself with fangs like Throgmorton's. He made Christopher wear a big, shiny tooth brace, which he was supposed never to take out, even at night. Christopher hated the brace. He hated it so much that it almost took his mind off his fears about school. The servants covered the furniture with dust sheets and left one by one, until Christopher and the last governess were the only people in the house. The governess took him to the station in a cab that afternoon and put him on the train to school. On the platform, now the time had come, Christopher was suddenly scared stiff. This really was the first step on the road to becoming a missionary and being eaten by heathens. Terror seemed to drain the life out of him, down from his face, which went stiff, and out through his legs, which went wobbly. It seemed to make his terror worse that he had not the slightest idea what school was like. He hardly heard the last governess say, "'Goodbye, Christopher. Your uncle says he'll give you a month at school to settle down. He'll expect you to meet his man as usual on October the 8th in Series 6. October the 8th. Have you got that?' Yes, Christopher said, not attending to a word, and got into the carriage like someone going to be executed. There were two other new boys in the carriage. The small, thin one called Fenning was so nervous that he had to keep leaning out of the window to be sick. The other one was called O'Neir, and he was restfully ordinary. By the time the train drew into the school station, Christopher was firm friends with them both. They decided to call themselves the Terrible Three, but in fact everyone in the school called them the Three Bears. "'Someone's been sitting in my chair!' they shouted whenever the three came into a room together. This was because Christopher was tall, though he had not known he was before, and Fenning was small, while O'Neir was comfortably in the middle." Before the end of the first week, Christopher was wondering what he had been so frightened of. School had its drawbacks, of course, like its food and some of the masters, and quite a few of the older boys, but those were nothing beside the sheer fun of being with a lot of boys your own age and having two real friends of your own. Christopher discovered that you dealt with obnoxious masters and most older boys the way you dealt with governesses. You quite politely told them the truth in the way they wanted to hear it, so that they thought they had won and left you in peace. Lessons were easy. In fact, most of the new things Christopher learned were from the other boys. After less than three days, he had learned enough, without quite knowing how, to realise that Mama had never intended him to be a missionary at all. This made him feel a bit of a fool but he did not let it bother him. When he thought of Mama, he thought much more kindly of her, and threw himself into school with complete enjoyment. The one lesson he did not enjoy was magic. Christopher found, rather to his surprise, that someone had put him down for magic as an extra. 
he had a dim notion that Tackroy might have arranged it. If so, Christopher showed no sign of the strong gift for magic Tackroy thought he had. The elementary spells he had to learn bored him nearly to tears. Please control your enthusiasm, Chant, the magic master said acidly. I'm heartily sick of looking at your tonsils. Two weeks into the term, he suggested Christopher give up magic. Christopher was tempted to agree, but he had discovered by then that he was good at other lessons, and he hated the thought of being a failure even in one thing. Besides, the goddess had stuck his feet to the spot by magic, and he wanted very much to learn to do that too. But my mother's paying for these lessons, sir, he said virtuously. I will try in future. He went away and made an arrangement with O'Neill, whereby Christopher did O'Neill's algebra, and O'Neill made the boring spells work for Christopher. After that, he cultivated a vague look to disguise his boredom, and stared out of the window. Wool gathering again, chant, the magic teacher took to asking. Can't you muster an honest yawn these days? Apart from this one weekly lesson, school was so entirely to Christopher's taste that he did not think of Uncle Rafe or anything to do with the past for well over a month. Looking back on it later, he often thought that if he had known what a short time he was going to be at that school, he would have taken care to enjoy it even more. At the start of November, he got a letter from Uncle Rafe. Old chap, what exactly are you playing at? I thought we had an arrangement. The experiments have been waiting for you since October, and a lot of people's plans have been thrown out. If something's wrong and you can't do it, write and tell me. Otherwise, get off your ham bones, there's a good chap, and contact my man as usual next Thursday. Your affectionate but puzzled uncle, Rafe. This caused Christopher quite a rush of guilt. Oddly enough, though he did think of Tackroy going uselessly into trances in his garret, most of his guilt was about the goddess. School had taught him that you did not take swears and swaps lightly. He had sworn to swap Throgmorton for books, and he had let the goddess down, even though she was only a girl. School considered that far worse than not doing what your uncle wanted. In his guilt, Christopher realised that he was going to have to spend Uncle Rafe's sovereign at last, if he was to give the goddess anything near as valuable as Throgmorton. A pity, because he now knew that a gold sovereign was big money. But at least he would still have Uncle Rafe's sixpence. The trouble was, school had also taught him that girls were a complete mystery, and quite different from boys. He had no idea what books girls liked. He was forced to consult O'Neill, who had an older sister. All sorts of slush, O'Neill said, shrugging. I can't remember what. Then could you come down to the bookshop with me and see if you can see some of them? Christopher asked. I might, O'Neill agreed. What's in it for me? I'll do your geometry tonight as well as your algebra, Christopher said. On this understanding, O'Neill went down to the bookshop with Christopher in the space between lessons and tea. There, he almost immediately picked out the Arabian Nights, unexpurgated. This one's good, he said. He followed it with something called Little Tanya and the Fairies, which Christopher took one look at and put hastily back on the shelf. I know my sister's read that one, O'Neill said, rather injured. Who's the girl you want it for? She's about the same age as us, Christopher said, and since O'Neill was looking at him for a further explanation that he was fairly sure O'Neill was not going to believe in someone called the goddess, he added, I've got this cousin called Caroline. This was quite true. Mama had once shown him a studio photo of his cousin, all lace and curls. O'Neill was not to know that this had nothing whatsoever to do with the sentence that had gone before. Wait a sec, then, O'Neill said and I'll see if I can spot some of the real slush. He wandered on along the shelf, leaving Christopher to flip through the Arabian Nights. It did look good, Christopher thought, 
Unfortunately, he could see from the pictures that it was all about somewhere very like the goddess's own anywhere. He suspected the goddess would call it educational. Ah, here we are. This is surefire slush, Hunia called, pointing to a whole row of books. These Millie books. Our house is full of the things. Millie goes to school, Christopher read. Millie of Lowood House. Millie plays the game. He picked up one called Millie's Finest Hour. It had some very brightly coloured schoolgirls on the front, and in small print, another moral and uplifting story about your favourite schoolgirl. You will weep with Millie, rejoice with Millie, and meet all your friends from Lowood House School again. Does your sister really like these? he asked incredulously. Wallows in them, said O'Neill. She reads them over and over again, and cries every time. Though this seemed a funny way to enjoy a book, Christopher was sure O'Neill knew best. The books were two and sixpence each. Christopher chose out the first five, up to Millie in the upper fourth, and bought the Arabian Nights for himself with the rest of the money. After all, it was his gold sovereign. Could you wrap the Millie books in something waterproof? He asked the assistant. They have to go to a foreign country. The assistant obligingly produced some sheets of waxed paper and, without being asked, made a handle for the parcel out of string. That night, Christopher hid the parcel in his bed. O'Neill pinched a candle from the kitchens and read aloud from the Arabian Nights, which turned out to have been a remarkably good buy. Unexpurgated. Seemed to mean that all sorts of interestingly dirty bits had been put in. Christopher was so absorbed that he almost forgot to work out how he might get to the place between from the dormitory. It was probably important to go around a corner. He decided the best corner was the one beyond the washstands, just beside Fenning's bed, and then settled down to listen to Anir until the candle burned out. After that, he would be on his way. To his exasperation, nothing happened at all. Christopher lay and listened to the snores, the mutters, and the heavy breathing of the other boys for hours. At length, he got up with the parcel and tiptoed across the cold floor to the corner beyond Fenning's bed. But he knew this was not right, even before he bumped into the washstands. He went back to bed, where he lay for further hours, and nothing happened, even when he went to sleep. The next day was Thursday, the day he was supposed to meet Tackroy. Knowing he would be too busy to deliver the books that night, Christopher left them in his bedside locker and read aloud from the Arabian Nights himself, so that he could control the time when everyone went to sleep. And so he did. All the other boys duly began to snore and mutter and puff as they always did, and Christopher was left lying awake alone, unable to get to the place between, or to fall asleep either. By this time, he was seriously worried. Perhaps the only way to get to the anywheres was from the night nursery of the house in London, or perhaps it was an ability he had simply grown out of. He thought of Tackroy in a useless trance, and the goddess vowing the vengeance of Asheth on him, and he heard the birds beginning to sing before he got to sleep that night. Seven. The next morning, Matron noticed Christopher stumbling about, aching-eyed and scarcely awake. She pounced on him. "Can't sleep, can you?" she said. "I always watch the ones with tooth braces. I don't think these dentists realise how uncomfortable they are. I'm going to come and take that away from you before lights out tonight, and you can come and fetch it in the morning. I make Mainwright Major do that too. It works wonders. You'll see." Christopher had absolutely no faith in this idea. Everyone knew this was one of the bees in Matron's bonnet, but to his surprise, it worked. He found himself dropping asleep as soon as Fenning began reading the Arabian Nights. He had just presence of mind to fumble the parcel of books from his locker before he was dead to the world. And here, an even more surprising thing happened. 
He got out of bed, carrying the parcel, and walked across the dormitory without anyone appearing to notice him at all. He walked right beside Fenning, and Fenning just went on reading with the stolen candle balanced on his pillow. Nobody seemed to realise when Christopher walked around the corner, out of the dormitory, and on to the valley path. His clothes were lying in the path, and he put them on, hanging the parcel from his belt so that he would have both hands free for the place between. And there was the place between. So much had happened since Christopher had last been here that he saw it as if this was the first time. His eyes tried to make sense of the shapeless way the rock slanted and couldn't. The formlessness stirred a formless kind of fear in him, which the wind and the mist and the rain beating in the mist made worse. The utter emptiness was more frightening still. As Christopher set off, climbing and sliding down to series ten, with the wind wailing around him and the fog drops making the rocks wet and slippery, he thought he had been right to think when he was small that this was the part left over when all the worlds were made. The place between was exactly that. There was no one here to help him if he slipped and broke a leg. When the parcel of books unbalanced him and he did slip and skidded twenty feet before he could stop, his heart was in his mouth. If he had not known that he had climbed across here a hundred times, he would have known he was mad to try. It was quite a relief to clamber into the hot valley and walk down to the muddy walled city. The old men were still charming snakes outside it. Inside, was the same hot clamour of smells and goats and people under umbrellas, and Christopher found he was still afraid, except that now he was afraid of someone pointing at him and shouting, "There's the thief that stole the temple cat!" He kept feeling that spear thudding into his chest. He began to get annoyed with himself. It was as if school had taught him how to be frightened. When he got to the alley beside the temple wall. Where turnips had been thrown away this time, he was almost too scared to go on. He had to make himself push into the spiked wall by counting to a hundred, and then telling himself he had to go. And when he was most of the way through, he stopped again, staring through the creepers at the cats in the blazing sun, and did not seem to be able to go on. But the cats took no notice of him. No one was about. Christopher told himself that it was silly to come all this way just to stand in a wall. He pulled himself out of the creepers and tiptoed to the overgrown archway, with the parcel of books butting him heavily with every step. The goddess was sitting on the ground in the middle of the shady yard, playing with a large family of kittens. Two of them were ginger, with a strong look of Throgmorton. When she saw Christopher, the goddess jumped to her feet with an energetic clash of jewellery, scattering kittens in all directions. "You've brought the books," she said. "I never thought you would." "I always keep my word," Christopher said, showing off a little. The goddess watched him unhitch the parcel from his belt, as if she could still scarcely believe it. Her hands trembled a little as she took the waxy parcel. And trembled even more as she knelt on the tiles and tore and ripped and pulled until the paper and string came off. The kittens seized on the string and the wrappings and did all sorts of acrobatics with them, but the goddess had eyes only for the books. She knelt and gazed. Ooh, five of them, just like Christmas, Christopher remarked. What's Christmas? The goddess asked absently. She was absorbed in stroking the covers of the books. When she had done that, she opened each one, peeped inside, and then shut it hastily, as if the sight was too much. Oh, I remember," she said. "Christmas is a heathen festival, isn't it?" "The other way around," said Christopher. "You're the heathens." "No, we're not. Asheth's true," said the goddess, not really attending. Five," she said. That should last me a week if I read slowly on purpose. Which is the best one to start with? I brought you the first five, Christopher said. Start with Millie goes to school. You mean there are more? The goddess exclaimed. How many? I didn't count. 
About five, Christopher said. Five? You don't want another cat, do you? said the goddess. No, Christopher said firmly. One Throgmorton is quite enough, thanks. But I've nothing else to swap, said the goddess. I must have those other five books. She jumped up with an impetuous clash of jewellery and began wrestling to unwind a snake-like bracelet from the top of her arm. Perhaps Mother Proudfoot won't notice if this is missing. There's a whole chest of bracelets in there. Christopher wondered what she thought he would do with the bracelet. Wear it? He knew what school would think of that. Hadn't you better read these books first? You might not like them, he pointed out. I know they're perfect, said the goddess, still wrestling. I'll bring you the other books as a present, Christopher said hastily. But that means I'll have to do something for you. Asheth always pays her debts, the goddess said. The bracelet came off with a twang. Here, I'll buy the books from you with this. Take it. She pushed the bracelet into Christopher's hand. The moment it touched him, Christopher found himself falling through everything that was there. The yard, the creepers, the kittens all turned to mist, as did the goddess's round face, frozen in the middle of changing from eagerness to astonishment, and Christopher fell out of it, down and down, and landed violently on his bed in the dark dormitory. Crash! What was that? said Fenning, quavering a little. And O'Neill remarked, apparently in his sleep, Help! Someone's fallen off the ceiling! Shall I fetch Matron? asked someone else. Don't be an ass! I just had a dream, Christopher said, rather irritably, because it had given him quite a shock. It was a further shock to find he was in pyjamas and not in the clothes he knew he had put on in the valley. When the other boys had settled down, he felt all over his bed for the parcel of books, and when they did not seem to be there, felt for the bracelet instead. He could not find that either. He searched again in the morning, but there was no sign of it. He supposed that was not so surprising when he thought how much Uncle Rafe had said Throgmorton was worth. Twelve and sixpence worth of books was a pretty poor swap for several thousand pounds worth of cat. Something must have noticed that he was cheating the goddess. He knew he was going to have to find the money for those other five books somehow and take them to the goddess. Meanwhile, he had missed Tackroy, and he supposed he had better try to meet him next Thursday instead. He was not looking forward to it. Tackroy was bound to be pretty annoyed by now. When Thursday came, Christopher nearly forgot Tackroy. It was only by accident that he happened to fall asleep during a particularly tedious story in the Arabian Nights. The Arabian Nights had become the dormitory's favourite reading. They took it in turns to steal a candle and read aloud to the others. It was O'Neill's turn that night, and O'Neill read all on one note like the school chaplain reading the Bible. And that night he was deep into a confusing set of people who were called calendars. Fenning made everyone groan by suggesting they got their name from living in the part of the world where dates grew, and Christopher dropped off to sleep. Next thing he knew, he was walking out into the valley. Tackroy was sitting in the park beside the heap of Christopher's clothes. Christopher eyed those clothes and wondered how they got there. Tackroy was sitting with his arms wrapped around his knees as if he were resigned to a long wait, and he seemed quite surprised to see Christopher. I didn't expect to see you, he said, and he grinned, though he looked tired. Christopher felt ashamed and awkward. I suppose you must be pretty angry, he began. Stow it, said Tackroy. I get paid for going into trances and you don't. It's just a job for me. Though I must say I miss you being around to firm me up. He stretched his legs out across the path, and Christopher could see stones and grass through the green worsted trousers. Then he stretched his arms above his head and yawned. You don't really want to go on with these experiments, do you? he asked. You've been busy with school, and that's much more fun than climbing into valleys of a night, isn't it? Because Tackroy was being so nice about it, Christopher felt more ashamed than ever. 
he had forgotten how nice Tackroy was. Now he thought about it, he had missed him quite badly. Of course I want to go on, he said. Where are we going tonight? Nowhere, said Tackroy. I'm nearly out of this trance as it is. This was just an effort to contact you. But if you really want to go on, your uncle is sending the carriage to Series 6 next Thursday. You know, the place that's living in an ice age. You do want to go on? Really? Tackroy looked up at Christopher, with his eyes screwed into anxious lines. You don't have to, you know. Yes, but I will, Christopher said. See you next Thursday. And he dashed back to bed, where, to his delight, something seemed to be happening to the calendars at last. The rest of that term passed very swiftly, from lesson to lesson, from tale to tale in the Arabian Nights, from Thursday to Thursday. The longest parts were the weekly magic lessons. Climbing across the place between to meet Tackroy the first Thursday, Christopher still felt quite frightened, but it made a difference knowing that Tackroy was waiting for him outside the Fifth Valley along. Soon he was used to it again, and the experiments went on as before. Someone had arranged for Christopher to stay for the Christmas holidays with Uncle Charles and Aunt Alice, the parents of his cousin Caroline. They lived in a big house in the country quite near, in Surrey, too, and Cousin Caroline, in spite of being three years younger and a girl, turned out to be good fun. Christopher enjoyed learning all the things people did in the country, including snowballing with the stable lads and Caroline, and trying to sit on Caroline's fat pony. But he was puzzled that no one mentioned Papa. Uncle Charles was Papa's brother. He realised that Papa must be in disgrace with his whole family. In spite of this, Aunt Alice made sure he had a good Christmas, which was kind of her. Christopher's most welcome Christmas present was another gold sovereign inside a card from Uncle Rafe. That meant he could afford more books for the goddess. As soon as school started again, he went down to the bookshop and bought the other five Millie books and had them wrapped in wax paper like the others. That was another twelve and sixpence towards the cost of Throgmorton. At this rate, he thought, he would be carrying parcels of books across the place between for the rest of his life. In the temple, the goddess was in her dimly lit room, bent over Millie's finest hour. When Christopher came in, she jumped and stuffed the book guiltily under her cushions. Oh, it's only you, she said. Don't ever come in quietly like that again, or I shall be a dead Asheth on the spot. Whatever happened last time? You turned into a ghost and went down through the floor. I'd no idea, said Christopher, except that I fell on my bed with a crash. I brought you the other five books. Wonderful! The goddess began eagerly. Then she stopped and said soberly, It's very kind of you, but I'm not sure Asheth wants me to have them, after what happened when I tried to give you the bracelet. No, said Christopher. I think Asheth must know that Throgmorton's worth thousands of pounds. I could bring you the whole school library, and it still wouldn't pay for him. Oh, said the goddess, in that case, how is Throgmorton, by the way? Since Christopher had no idea, he said airily, trotting around, bullying other cats and scratching people, and changed the subject before the goddess realised he was only guessing. Were the first five books all right? The goddess's round face became all smile, so much smile that her face could hardly hold it, and she spread her arms out as well. They're the most marvellous books in this world. It's like really being at Lowood House School. I cry every time I read them. O'Neill had got it right, Christopher thought, watching the goddess unwrap the new parcel with little cries of pleasure and much chinking of bracelets. Oh, Millie does get to be head girl, she cried out, picking up head girl Millie. I've been wondering and wondering whether she would. She must have got the better of that awful prig Delphinia after all. She stroked the book lovingly, and then took Christopher by surprise by asking, What happened when you took Throgmorton? Mother Proudfoot told me that the arm of Asheth killed the thief. They tried, Christopher said awkwardly, trying to sound casual. 
In that case, said the goddess, you were very brave to honour the swap, and you deserve to be rewarded. Would you like a reward? Not a swap or a payment. A reward. If you can think of one, Christopher said cautiously. Then come with me, said the goddess. She got up briskly, clash tink. She collected the new books and the old one from among the cushions, and gathered up the paper and the string. Then she threw the whole bundle at the wall. All of it, all six books and the wrappings, turned over on itself and shut itself out of sight, as if a lid had come down on an invisible box. There was nothing to tell that any of it had been there. Once again, Christopher was impressed. That's so Mother Proudfoot won't know, the goddess explained as she led the way into the shady yard. I like her a lot, but she's very stern and she's into everything. How do you get the books back? asked Christopher. I beckon the one I want, said the goddess, pushing through the creeper in the archway. It's a by-product of being the living Asheth. She led him across the blazing yard, among the cats, to an archway he remembered rather too well for comfort. It was the one he had fled into with Throgmorton yowling in the basket. Christopher began to be nervously and gloomily certain that the goddess's idea of a reward was nothing like his own. Won't there be a lot of people? he asked, hanging back rather. Not for a while. They snore for hours in the hot season, the goddess said confidently. Christopher followed her reluctantly along a set of dark passages, not quite the way he had run before, he thought, though it was hard to be sure. At length they came to a wide archway hung with nearly transparent yellow curtains. There was a rich gleam of daylight beyond. The goddess parted the curtains and waved Christopher through, tink clash. There seemed to be an old, dark tree in front of them, so old that it was thoroughly worm-eaten and had lost most of its branches. And something was making a suffocating smell, a little like church incense, but much thicker and stronger. The goddess marched around the tree, down some shallow steps, and into the space full of rich daylight which was blocked off by more yellow curtains a few yards away, like a tall golden room. Here she turned around to face the tree. This is the shrine of Asheth, she said. Only initiates are allowed here. This is your reward. Look, here I am. Christopher turned around and felt decidedly cheated. From this side... The tree turned out to be a monstrous statue of a woman with four arms. From the front it looked solid gold. Clearly the temple had not bothered to coat the back of the wooden statue with gold, but they had made up for it on the front. Every visible inch of the woman shone buttery yellow gold, and she was hung with golden chains, bracelets, anklets and earrings. Her skirt was cloth of gold, and she had a big ruby embedded in each of her four golden palms. More precious stones blazed from her high crown. The shrine was made so that daylight slanted dramatically down from the roof, touching each precious stone with splendour, but veiled by the thick smoke climbing from golden burners beside the woman's huge golden feet. The effect was decidedly heathen. After waiting a moment for Christopher to say something, the goddess said, This is Asheth. She's me and I'm her. And this is her divine aspect. I thought you'd like to meet me as I really am. Christopher turned to the goddess, meaning to say, No, you're not. You haven't got four arms. But the goddess was standing in the smoky yellow space with her arms stretched out to the side in the same position as the statue's top pair of arms, and she did indeed have four arms. The lower pair were misty, and he could see the yellow curtain through them, but they had the same sort of bracelets, and they were arranged just like the statue's lower pair of arms. They were obviously as real as Tacroy before he was firmed up. So he looked up at the statue's smooth golden face. He thought it looked hard and cruel behind its blank golden stare. She doesn't look as clever as you, he said. It was the only thing he could think of that was not rude. She's got her very stupid expression on, the goddess said. 
Don't be fooled by that. She doesn't want people to know how clever she really is. It's a very useful expression. I use it a lot in lessons, when Mother Proudfoot or Mother Dowson go boring on. It was a useful expression, Christopher thought, a good deal better than his vague look which he used in magic lessons. How do you make it? he asked with great interest. Before the goddess could reply, footsteps padded behind the statue. A strong voice, musical but sharp, called out, Goddess, what are you doing in the shrine at this hour? Christopher and the goddess went into two separate states of panic. Christopher turned to plunge out through the other set of yellow curtains, heard sandals slapping about out there too, and turned back in despair. The goddess whispered, Oh, blast Mother Proudfoot! She seems to know where I am by instinct, somehow. And she spun around in circles, trying to wrestle a bracelet off her upper arm. A long, bare foot and most of a leg in a rust-coloured robe appeared around the golden statue. Christopher gave himself up for lost. But the goddess, seeing she was never going to get the bracelet off in time, snatched his hand and held it against the whole heap of jingling jewellery on her arm. Just as before, everything turned misty, and Christopher fell through it, into his bed in the dormitory. Crash! "'I wish you wouldn't do that,' Fenning said, waking up with a jump. "'Can't you control those dreams of yours?' "'Yes,' Christopher said, sweating at his narrow escape. "'I'm never going to have a dream like that again.' It was a silly set-up, anyway. A live girl pretending to be a goddess who was nothing but a worm-eaten wooden statue. He had nothing against the goddess herself. He admired her quick thinking, and he would have liked to learn both the very stupid expression and how you did that vanishing trick with the books. But it was not worth the danger. For the rest of the spring term... Christopher went regularly to the Anywheres with Tackroy, but he did not try to go to one on his own. By now, Uncle Rafe seemed to have a whole round of experiments set up. Christopher met Tackroy in Series 1, 3, 5, 7 and 9, and then in 8, 6, 4 and 2, always in that order, but not always in the same place or outside the same valley. In each anywhere, people would be waiting with a pile of packages, which, by the weight and feel, had different things inside each time. The parcels in Series 1 were always knobby and heavy, and in 4 they were smooth boxes. In Series 2 and 5 they were squashy and smelled of fish, which made sense, since both those anywheres had so much water in them. In Series 8... The women always breathed garlic, and those parcels had the same strong odour every time. Beyond that, there seemed no rule. Christopher got to know most of the people who supplied the packages, and he laughed and joked with them as he loaded the horseless carriage. And as the experiments went on, Uncle Rafe's wizards gradually perfected the carriage. By the end of the term, it moved under its own power and Tackroy and Christopher no longer had to drag it up the valleys to the place between. In fact, the experiments had become so routine that they were not much of a change from school. Christopher thought of other things while he worked, just as he did in magic lessons and English and chapel at school. Why don't we ever go to Series 11? he asked Tackroy as they walked up one of the valleys from Series 1 with another heavy knobby load gliding behind on the carriage. Nobody goes to eleven, Tackroy said shortly. Christopher could see he wanted to change the subject. He asked why. Because, said Tackroy, because they're peculiar, unfriendly people there, I suppose, if you can call them people. Nobody knows much about them, because they make damn sure nobody sees them. And that's all I know, except that eleven's not a series. There's only one world. Tackroy refused to say more than that, which was annoying, because Christopher had a strong feeling that Tackroy did know more. But Tackroy was in a bad mood that week. His grandmotherly lady had gone down with flu, and Tackroy was making do with the stern, flute-playing young lady. 
Somewhere in our world, he said, sighing, there is a young lady who plays the harp and doesn't mind if I turn transparent, but there are too many difficulties in the way between us. Probably because Tackroy kept saying things like this, Christopher now had a very romantic image of him starving in his garret and crossed in love. Why won't Uncle Rafe let me come and see you in London? he asked. I told you to stow it, Christopher, Tackroy said. And he stopped further talk by stepping out into the mists of the place between, with the carriage billowing behind him. Tackroy's romantic background nagged at Christopher all that term, particularly when a casual word he dropped in the dormitory made it clear that none of the other boys had ever met a foundling child. I wish I was one, O'Neill said. I wouldn't have to go into my father's business then. After that, Christopher felt he would not even mind meeting the flute-playing young lady. But this was driven out of his mind when there proved to be a muddle over the arrangements for the Easter holidays. Mama wrote and said he was to come to her in Genoa, but at the last moment she turned out to be going to Weimar instead, where there was no room for Christopher. He had to spend nearly a week at school on his own after everyone had gone home, while the school wrote to Uncle Charles, and Uncle Charles arranged for Papa's other brother, Uncle Conrad, to have him in four days' time. Meanwhile, since the school was closing, Christopher was sent to stay with Uncle Rafe in London. Uncle Rafe was away, to Christopher's disappointment. Most of his house was shut up, with locked doors everywhere and the only person there was the housekeeper. Christopher spent the few days wandering around London by himself. It was almost as good as exploring in anywhere. There were parks and monuments and street musicians, and every road, however narrow, was choked with high-wheeled carts and carriages. On the second day, Christopher found himself at Covent Garden Market, among piles of fruit and vegetables and he stayed there till the evening, fascinated by the porters. Each of them could carry at least six loaded baskets in a tall pile on his head, without even wobbling. At last he turned to come away, and saw a familiar sturdy figure in a green worsted suit walking down the narrow street ahead of him. Tackroy! Christopher screamed and went racing after him. Tackroy did not appear to hear. He went walking on, with his curly head bent in a rather dejected way, and turned the corner into the next narrow street before Christopher had caught up. When Christopher skidded around the corner, there was no sign of him. But he knew it had been, unmistakably, Tackroy. The garret must be somewhere quite near. He spent the rest of his stay in London, hanging around Covent Garden, hoping for another glimpse of Tackroy. But it did no good. Tackroy did not appear again. After that, Christopher went to stay at Uncle Conrad's house in Wiltshire, where the main drawback proved to be his cousin Francis. Cousin Francis was the same age as Christopher, and he was the kind of boy Fenning called a stuck-up prattrel. Christopher despised Francis on this account, and Francis despised Christopher for having been brought up in town and never having ridden to hounds. In fact, there was another reason too, which emerged when Christopher fell heavily off the quietest pony in the stables for the seventh time. "'Can't do magic, can you?' Francis said, looking smugly down at Christopher from the great height of his trim bay gelding. "'I'm not surprised.' It's your father's fault for marrying that awful Argent woman. No one in my family has anything to do with your father now. Since Christopher was fairly sure that Francis had used magic to bring him off the pony, there was not much he could do but clench his teeth and feel that Papa was well shot of this particular branch of the chance. It was a relief to go back to school again. It was more than a relief... It was the cricket season. Christopher became obsessed with cricket almost overnight. So did O'Neill. It's the king of games, O'Neill said devoutly, and went and bought every book on the subject that he could afford. 
He and Christopher decided they were going to be professional cricketers when they grew up. And my father's business can just go hang, O'Neill said. Christopher quite agreed. Only in his case, it was Mama's plans for society. I've made up my mind for myself, he thought. It was like being released from a vow. He was quite surprised to find how determined and ambitious he was. He and O'Neill practiced all day, and Fenning, who was no good really, was persuaded to run after the balls. In between, they talked cricket, and at night, Christopher had normal, ordinary dreams, all about cricket. It seemed quite an interruption on the first Thursday when he had to give up dreams of cricket and meet Tackroy in Series Five. I saw you in London, Christopher said to him. Your garret's near Covent Garden, isn't it? Covent Garden, Tackroy said blankly. It's nowhere near there. You must have seen someone else. And he stuck to that, even when Christopher described in great detail which street it was and what Tackroy had looked like. No, he said, you must have been running after a complete stranger. Christopher knew it had been Tackroy. He was puzzled, but there seemed no point in going on arguing. He began loading the carriage with fishy-smelling bundles and went back to thinking about cricket. Naturally, not thinking what he was doing, he let go of a bundle in the wrong place. It fell half through Tackroy and slapped to the ground, where it lay leaking an even fishier smell than before. "Poo!" said Christopher. "What is this stuff?" "No idea," said Tackroy. "I'm only your uncle's errand boy. What's the matter? Is your mind somewhere else tonight?" "Sorry," Christopher said, collecting the bundle. "I was thinking of cricket." Tackroy's face lit up. "Are you bowler or batsman?" "Batsman," said Christopher. "I want to be a professional." "I'm a bowler myself," said Tackroy. "Slow leg spin, and though I say it myself, I'm not half bad. I play quite a lot for, well, it's a village team really, but we usually win. I usually end up taking seven wickets, and I can bat a bit too. What are you? An opener?" "No." I fancy myself as a stroke player," Christopher said. They talked cricket all the time. Christopher was loading the carriage. After that, they walked on the beach with the blue surf crashing beside them, and went on talking cricket. Tackroy several times tried to demonstrate his skill by picking up a pebble, but he could not get firm enough to hold it. So Christopher found a piece of driftwood to act as a bat, and Tackroy gave him advice on how to hit. After that, Tackroy gave Christopher a coaching session in whatever anywhere they happened to be, and both of them talked cricket non-stop. Tackroy was a good coach. Christopher learned far more from him than he did from the sportsmaster at school. He had more and more splendid ambitions of playing professionally for Surrey or somewhere, cracking the ball firmly to the boundary all around the ground. In fact, Tackroy taught him so well. That he began to have quite real everyday ambitions of getting into the school team. They were reading O'Neill's cricket books aloud in the dormitory. Now, a matron had discovered the Arabian Nights and taken it away, but nobody minded. Every boy in the dormitory, even Fenning, was cricket mad, and Christopher was most obsessed of all. Then disaster struck. It began with Tackroy saying. By the way, there's a change of plan. Can you meet me in Series Ten next Thursday? Someone seems to be trying to spoil your uncle's experiments, so we have to change the routine. Christopher was distracted from cricket by slight guilt at that. He knew he ought to make a further payment for Throgmorton, and he was afraid that the goddess might have supernatural means of knowing he had been to Series Ten without bringing her any more books. He went rather wearily to the valley. Tackroy was not there. It took Christopher a good hour of climbing and scrambling to locate him at the mouth of quite a different valley. By this time, Tackroy had become distinctly misty and unfirm. "Dunderhead," Tackroy said while Christopher hastily firmed him up. "I was going to lose this trance any second. 
You know there's more than one place in this series. What got into you? I was probably thinking of cricket, Christopher said. The place beyond the New Valley was nothing like as primitive and heathen-seeming as the place where the goddess lived. It was a vast dockside, with tremendous cranes towering overhead. Some of the biggest ships Christopher had ever seen, enormous rusty iron ships, very strangely shaped, were tied up to cables so big that he had to step over them as if they were logs. But he knew it was still Series 10 when the man waiting with an iron cart full of little kegs said, Praise Asheth, I thought you were never coming. Yes, make haste, Tackroy said. This place is safer than that heathen city, but there may be enemies around all the same. Besides, the sooner you finish, the sooner we can get to work on your forward defensive play. Christopher hurried to roll the little kegs from the iron cart to the carriage. When all the kegs were in, he hurried to fasten the straps that held the loads on it. And of course, because he was hurrying, one of the straps slithered out of his hand and fell back on the other side of the carriage. He had to lean right over the load to get it. He could hear iron clanking in the distance and a few shouts, but he thought nothing of it, until Tackroy suddenly sprang into sight beside him. Off there! Get off! Tackroy shouted, tugging uselessly at Christopher with misty hands. Christopher, still lying across the kegs, looked up to see a giant hook on the end of a chain travelling towards him faster than he could run. That was really all he knew about it. The next thing he knew, rather dimly, was that he was lying in the path in his own valley beside his pyjamas. He realised that the iron hook must have knocked him out, and it was lucky that he had been more or less lying across the carriage, or Tackroy would never have got him home. A little shakily, he got back into his pyjamas. His head ached, so he shambled straight back to bed in the dormitory. In the morning, he did not even have a headache. He forgot about it, and went straight out after breakfast to play cricket with Anir and six other boys. Bags I bat first, he shouted. Everyone shouted it at the same time, but O'Neill had been carrying the bat and he was not going to let go. Everyone, including Christopher, grabbed at him. There was a silly, laughing tussle, which ended when O'Neill spung the bat around in a playful, threatening circle. The bat met Christopher's head with a heavy thuck. It hurt. He remembered hearing several other distinct cracks just over his left ear, as if the bones of his skull were breaking up like an ice puddle. Then, in a way that was remarkably like the night before, he knew nothing at all for quite a long time. When he came around, he knew it was much later in the day. Though the sheet had somehow got over his face, he could see late evening light coming in through a window high up in one corner. He was very cold, particularly his feet. Someone had obviously taken his shoes and socks off to put him to bed. But where had they put him? The window was in the wrong place for the dormitory, or for any other room he had slept in for that matter. He pushed the sheet off and sat up. He was on a marble slab, in a cold, dim room. It was no wonder he felt cold. He was only wearing underclothes. All around him were other marble slabs, most of them empty. But some slabs had people lying on them, very still, and covered all over with white sheets. Christopher began to suspect where he might be. Wrapping the sheet around him for what little warmth it gave, he slid down from the marble slab and went over to the nearest white slab with a person on it. Carefully, he pulled back the sheet. This person had been an old tramp, and he was dead as a doornail. Christopher poked his cold, bristly face to make sure. Then he told himself to keep quite calm, which was a sensible thing to tell himself, but much too late. He was already in the biggest panic of his life. There was a big metal door down at the other end of the cold room. Christopher seized its handle and tugged. 
When the door turned out to be locked, he kicked it and beat at it with both hands and rattled the handle. He was still telling himself to be sensible, but he was shaking all over, and the panic was rapidly getting out of control. After a minute or so, the door was wrenched open by a fat, jolly-looking man in a white overall, who stared into the room irritably. He did not see Christopher at first. He was looking over Christopher's head, expecting someone taller. Christopher wrapped the sheet around himself accusingly. What do you mean by locking this door? he demanded. Everybody's dead in here. They're not going to run away. The man's eyes turned down to Christopher. He gave a slight moan. His eyes rolled up to the ceiling. His plump body slid down the door, and he landed at Christopher's feet in a dead faint. Christopher thought he was dead too. It put the last touch to his panic. He jumped over the man's body and rushed down the corridor beyond, where he found himself in a hospital. There, a nurse tried to stop him, but Christopher was beyond reason by then. Where's school? He shrieked at her. I'm missing cricket practice. For half an hour after that, the hospital was in total confusion, while everyone tried to catch a five-foot corpse clothed mostly in a flying sheet, which raced up and down the corridors, shrieking that it was missing cricket practice. They caught him at last outside the maternity ward, where a doctor hastily gave him something to make him sleep. Calm down, son, he said. It's a shock to us too, you know. When I last saw you, your head was like a run-over pumpkin. I'm missing cricket practice, I tell you," Christopher said. He woke up next day in a hospital bed. Mamma and Papa were both there, facing one another across it, dark clothes and whiskers on one side, scents and pretty colours on the other. As if to make it clear to Christopher that this was a bad crisis, the two of them were actually speaking to one another. Nonsense, Cosimo," Mamma was saying. "The doctor's just made a mistake. It was only a bad concussion, after all, and we both had a fright for nothing." The school matron said he was dead too," Papa said somberly. "And she's a flighty sort of type," Mamma said. "I don't believe a word of it." "Well, I do," said Papa. "He has more than one life, Miranda. It explains things about his horoscope that have always puzzled." Oh, fudge to your wretched horoscopes! Mamma cried. Be quiet! I shall not be quiet where I know the truth. Papa more or less shouted. I have done what needs to be done and sent a telegram to Dewitt about him. This obviously horrified Mamma. What a wicked thing to do! She raged, and without consulting me. I tell you, I shall not lose Christopher to your gloomy connivings, Cosimo. At this point. Both Mamma and Papa became so angry that Christopher closed his eyes. Since the stuff the doctor had given him was still making him feel sleepy, he dropped off almost at once. But he could still hear the quarrel even asleep. In the end, he climbed out of bed, slipping past Mamma and Papa without either of them noticing, and went to the place between. He found a new valley there, leading to somewhere where there was some kind of circus going on. Nobody in that world spoke English, but Christopher got by quite well, as he had often done before, by pretending to be deaf and dumb. When he came slipping back, the room was full of soberly dressed people who were obviously just leaving. Christopher slipped past a stout, solemn young man in a tight collar and a lady in a grey dress who was carrying a black leather instrument case. Neither of them knew he was there. By the look of things, the part of him left lying in the bed had just been examined by a specialist. As Christopher slipped around Mamma and got back into bed, he realised that the specialist was just outside the door, with Papa and another man in a beard. I agree that you were right in the circumstance to call me in, Christopher heard an old dry voice saying, but there is only one life present, Mister Chant. I admit freakish things can happen, of course, but we have the report of the school magic teacher to back up our findings in this case. I am afraid I am not convinced at all. The old dry voice went away up the corridor, still talking, 
and the other people followed, all except Mama. What a relief, Mama said. Christopher, are you awake? I thought for a moment that that dreadful old man was going to get hold of you, and I would never have forgiven your papa, never. I don't want you to grow up into a boring, law-abiding, policeman sort of person, Christopher. Mama wants to be proud of you. Christopher went back to school the next day. He was rather afraid that Mama was going to be disappointed in him when he turned out to be a professional cricketer, but that did not alter his ambition in the least. Everyone at school treated him as if he were a miracle. O'Neill apologised almost in tears. That was the only thing which made Christopher uncomfortable. Otherwise, he basked in the attention he got. He insisted on playing cricket just as before, and he could hardly wait for next Thursday to come so that he could tell Tackroy all his adventures. On Wednesday morning, the headmaster sent for Christopher. To his surprise, Papa was there with the head, both of them standing uneasily beside the head's mahogany desk. Well, John, the head said, we shall be sorry to lose our nine days' wonder so quickly. Your father has come to fetch you away. It seems you are to go to a private tutor instead. What? Leave school, sir? Christopher said. But it's cricket practice this afternoon, sir. I have suggested to your father that you might remain at least until the end of term, the head said. But it seems that the great Dr. Pawson will not agree to it. Papa cleared his throat. These Cambridge dons, he said. We both know what they are, headmaster. He and the head smiled at one another, rather falsely. Matron is packing you a bag now, said the head. In due course your box and your school report will be sent after you. Now we must say goodbye, as I gather your train leaves in half an hour. He shook hands with Christopher, a brisk, hard, headmasterly shake, and Christopher was whisked away, there and then, in a cab with Papa, without even a chance to say goodbye to Anir and Fenning. He sat in the train, seething about it, staring resentfully at Papa's whiskered profile. "'I was hoping to get into the school cricket team,' he said pointedly, when Papa did not seem to be going to explain. "'Shame about that,' Papa said. "'But there will be other cricket teams, no doubt. Your future is more important than cricket, my son.' "'My future is cricket,' Christopher said boldly. It was the first time he had come right out with his ambition to an adult. He went hot and cold at his daring in speaking like this to Papa. But he was glad, too, because this was an important step on the road to his career. Papa gave a melancholy smile. "'There was a time when I myself wanted to be an engine driver,' he said. "'These whims pass. "'It was more important to get you to Dr. Pawson before the end of term. "'Your mamma was planning to take you abroad with her then.' "'Christopher's teeth clenched so tightly with anger "'that his toothbrace cut his lip. "'Cricket a whim, indeed! "'Why is it so important? "'Dr. Pawson is the most eminent diviner in the country,' said Papa. I had to pull a few strings to get him to take you on at such short notice, but when I put the case to him, he himself said that it was urgent not to give DeWitt time to forget about you. DeWitt will revise his opinion of you when he finds out you have a gift for magic, after all. But I can't do magic, Christopher pointed out. And there must be some reason why not, said Papa. On the face of it, your gifts should be enormous, since I am an enchanter, and so are both my brothers, while your mamma, this I will grant her, is a highly gifted sorceress, and her brother, that wretched Argent fellow, is an enchanter too. Christopher watched houses rushing past behind Papa's profile as the train steamed into the outskirts of London, while he tried to digest this. No one had told him about his heredity before. 
Still, he supposed there were duds born into the most wizardly families. He thought he must be a dud. So Papa was truly an enchanter. Christopher resentfully searched Papa for the signs of power and riches that went with an enchanter, and the signs did not seem to be there. Papa struck him as threadbare and mournful. The cuffs of his frock coat were worn, and his hat looked dull and unprosperous. Even the black whiskers were thinner than Christopher remembered, with streaks of grey in them. But the fact was, enchanter or not, Papa had snatched him out of school in the height of the cricket season, and from the way the head had talked, he was not expected to go back. Why not? Why had Papa taken it into his head to do this to him? Christopher brooded about this while the train drew into the great southern terminus, and Papa towed him through the bustle to a cab. Galloping and rattling towards St Pancras Cross, he realised that it was going to be difficult even to see Tackroy and get some cricket coaching that way. Papa had told him to have nothing to do with Uncle Rafe, and Papa was an enchanter. In the small, sooty carriage of the train to Cambridge, Christopher asked resentfully, Papa, what made you decide to take me to Dr. Pawson? I thought I had explained, Papa said. That for a while seemed all he was going to say. Then he turned towards Christopher, sighing rather, and Christopher saw that he had just been gathering himself for a serious talk. Last Friday, he said, you were certified dead, my son, by two doctors and a number of other people. Yet when I arrived to identify your body on Saturday, you were alive and recovering and showing no signs of injury. This made me certain that you had more than one life, the more so as I suspect that this has happened once before. Tell me, Christopher, that time last year when they told me a curtain pole had fallen on you, you were mortally injured then, weren't you? You may confess to me. I shan't be angry. Yes, Christopher said reluctantly. I suppose I was. I thought so, Papa said with dismal satisfaction. Now, my son, those people who are lucky enough to have several lives are always invariably highly gifted enchanters. It was clear to me last Saturday that you are one. This was why I sent for Gabriel de Witt. Now, Monsignor de Witt... Here, Papa lowered his voice and looked nervously around the sooty carriage, as if he thought Monsignor de Witt could hear. Is the strongest enchanter in the world. He has nine lives. Nine, Christopher. This makes him strong enough to control the practice of magic throughout this world and several others. The government has given him that task. For this reason you will hear some people call him the Crestomancy. The post bears that title. But, said Christopher, what has all this and the Crestomancy got to do with pulling me out of school? Because I wish to wit to take an interest in your case, said Papa. I am a poor man now. I can do nothing for you. I have made considerable sacrifices to afford Dr. Pawson's fee, because I think DeWitt was wrong when he said you were a normal boy with only one life. My hope is that Dr. Pawson can prove he was wrong, and that DeWitt can then be persuaded to take you onto his staff. If he does, your future is assured. Take me onto his staff, Christopher thought, like O'Neill in his father's business having to start as an office boy. I don't think, he said, that I want my future assured like that. His father looked at him sorrowfully. There speaks your mamma in you, he said. Proper tuition should cure that sort of levity. This did nothing to reconcile Christopher to papa's plans. But I said that for myself, he thought angrily. It had nothing to do with mamma. He was still in a state of seething resentment when the train steamed into Cambridge, and he walked with Papa through streets full of young men in gowns like the coats people wore in Series 7, past tall turreted buildings that reminded him of the Temple of Asheth, except that the Cambridge buildings had more windows. 
Papa had rented rooms in a lodging house, a dark, mingy place that smelled of old dinners. We shall be staying here together while Dr. Pawson sorts you out, he told Christopher. I have brought ample work with me so that I can keep a personal eye on your well-being. This about put the lid on Christopher's angry misery. He wondered if he dared go to the place between to meet Tackroy on Thursday, with a full-grown enchanter keeping a careful eye on him. To crown it all, the lodging house bed was even worse than the beds at school, and twanged every time he moved. He went to sleep, thinking he was about as miserable as he could be. But that was before he saw Dr. Pawson, and realised his miseries had only just begun. Papa delivered him to Dr. Pawson's house in the Trumpington Road at ten the next morning. Dr. Pawson's learning gives him a disconcerting manner at times, Papa said, but I know I can trust my son to bear himself with proper politeness notwithstanding. This sounded ominous. Christopher's knees wobbled while the housemaid showed him into Dr. Pawson's room. It was a bright, bright room stuffed full of clutter. A harsh voice shouted out of the clutter, Stop! Christopher stood where he was, bewildered. Not a step further, and keep your knees still, boy. Lord, how the young do fidget! The harsh voice bellowed. How am I to assess you if you won't stay still? Now, what do you say? The largest thing among the clutter was a fat armchair. Dr. Pawson was sitting in it, not moving a muscle except for a quiver from his vast purple jowls. He was probably too fat to move. He was vastly, hugely, grossly fat. His belly was like a small mountain with a checked waistcoat stretched over it. His hands reminded Christopher of some purple bananas he had seen in Series 5. His face was stretched and purple, too, and out of it glared two merciless, watery eyes. "'How do you do, sir?' Christopher said, since Papa trusted him to be polite. "'No, no!' shouted Dr. Pawson. "'This is an examination, not a social call. "'What's your problem? Chant your name is, isn't it? "'State your problem, Chant.' "'I can't do magic, sir,' Christopher said. So can't a lot of people. Some are born that way, Dr. Pawson bawled. Do better than that, Chant. Show me. Don't do some magic and let me see. Christopher hesitated, out of bewilderment, mostly. Go on, boy, howled Dr. Pawson. Don't do it. I can't not do something I can't do, Christopher said, thoroughly harassed. Of course you can yelled Dr. Pawson. That's the essence of magic. Get on with it. Mirror on the table beside you. Levitate it and be quick about it. If Dr. Pawson hoped to startle Christopher into succeeding, he failed. Christopher stumbled to the table, looked into the elegant silver-framed mirror that was lying there, and went through the words and gestures he had learned at school. Nothing at all happened. Hmm, said Dr. Pawson. Don't do it again. Christopher realised he was supposed to try once more. He tried, with shaking hands and voice, and exasperated misery growing inside him. This was hopeless. He hated Papa for dragging him off to be terrorised by this appalling fat man. He wanted to cry and he had to remind himself, just as if he were his own governess, that he was far too big for that. And, as before, the mirror simply lay where it was. Hmm, said Dr. Pawson. Turn around, Chant. No right around, boy. Slowly, so that I can see all of you. Stop. Christopher stopped and stood and waited. Dr. Pawson shut his watery eyes and lowered his purple chins. Christopher suspected he had gone to sleep. There was utter silence in the room, except for clocks ticking among the clutter. 
Two clocks were the kind with all the works showing. One was a grandfather, and one was a mighty marble timepiece that looked as if it had come off someone's grave. Christopher nearly jumped out of his skin when Dr. Pawson suddenly barked at him like the clap of doom. Empty your pockets, chant! Hey, thought Christopher, but he did not dare disobey. He began hurriedly unloading the pockets of his Norfolk jacket. Uncle Rafe's sixpence, which he always kept, a shilling of his own, a greyish handkerchief, a note from Anir about algebra, and then he was down to shaming things like string and rubber bands and furry toffees. He hesitated. All of it, yelled Dr. Pawson. Out of every single pocket, put it all down on the table. Christopher went on unloading. A chewed rubber, a bit of pencil, peas for Fenning's pea shooter, a silver threepenny bit he had not known about, a cough drop, fluff, more fluff, string, a marble, an old pen nib, more rubber bands, more fluff, more string. And that was it. Dr. Pawson's eyes glared over him. No, that's not all. What else have you got on you? Type in. Get rid of that, too. Reluctantly, Christopher unpinned the nice silver type in Aunt Alice had given him for Christmas. And Dr. Pawson's eyes continued to glare at him. Ah, Dr. Pawson said. And that stupid thing you have on your teeth. That's got to go, too. Get it out of your mouth and put it on the table. What the devil's it for, anyway? To stop my teeth growing crooked, Christopher said rather huffily. Much as he hated the tooth brace, he hated even more being criticised about it. What's wrong with crooked teeth? howled Dr. Pawson, and he bared his own teeth. Christopher rather started back from the sight. Dr. Pawson's teeth were brown and they lay higgledy-piggledy in all directions, like a fence trampled by cows. While Christopher was blinking at them, Dr. Pawson bellowed, Now, do that levitation spell again. Christopher ground his teeth, which felt quite straight by contrast and very smooth without the brace, and turned to the mirror again. Once more he looked into it, once more said the words, and once more raised his arms aloft. And as his arms went up, he felt something come loose with them, come loose with a vengeance. Everything in the room went upwards, except Christopher, the mirror, the tie-pin, the toothbrace, and the money. These slid to the floor as the table surged upwards, but were collected by the carpet, which came billowing up after it. Christopher hastily stepped off the carpet and stood watching everything soar around him, all the clocks, several tables, chairs, rugs, pictures, vases, ornaments, and Dr. Pawson, too. He and his armchair both went up, majestically like a balloon, and bumped against the ceiling. The ceiling bellied upwards, and the chandelier plastered itself sideways against it. From above came crashings, shrieks, and an immense, airy grinding. Christopher could feel that the roof of the house had come off and was on its way to the sky, pursued by the attics. It was an incredible feeling. Stop that! Dr. Pawson roared. Christopher guiltily took his arms down. Instantly, everything began raining back to the ground again. The tables plunged, the carpets sank, vases, pictures and clocks crashed to the floor all around. Dr. Pawson's armchair plummeted with the rest, followed by pieces of the chandelier, but Dr. Pawson himself floated down smoothly, having clearly done some prudent magic of his own. Up above, the roof came down thunderously. Christopher could hear tiles falling and chimneys crashing, as well as smashings and howls from upstairs. The upper floors seemed now to be trying to get through to the ground. The walls of the room buckled and oozed plaster, while the windows bent and fell to pieces. It was about five minutes before the slidings and smashings died away, 
and the dust settled even more slowly. Dr. Pawson sat among the wreckage and the blowing dust and stared at Christopher. Christopher stared back, very much wanting to laugh. A little old lady suddenly materialised in the armchair opposite Dr. Pawson's. She was wearing a white nightgown and a lacy cap over her white hair. She smiled at Christopher in a steely way. So it was you, child, she said to Christopher. Mary Ellen is in hysterics. Don't ever do that again or I'll put a visitation on you. I'm still famed for my visitations, you know. Having said this, she was gone as suddenly as she had come. My old mother, said Dr. Pawson. She's normally bedridden, but as you can see, she's very strongly moved, as is almost everything else. He sat and stared at Christopher a while longer, and Christopher went on, struggling not to laugh. Silver, Dr. Pawson said at last. Silver? asked Christopher. Silver, said Dr. Pawson. Silver's the thing that's stopping you, Chart. Don't ask me why at the moment. Maybe we'll never get to the bottom of it, but there's no question about the facts. If you want to work magic, you'll have to give up money except for coppers and sovereigns. Throw away that type-in and get rid of that stupid brace. Christopher thought about Papa, about school, about cricket, in a flood of anger and frustration which gave him courage to say, But I don't think I do want to work magic, sir. Yes, you do, Chant, said Dr. Pawson, for at least the next month. And while Christopher was wondering how to contradict him without being too rude, Dr. Pawson gave out another vast bellow. You have to put everything back, Chant. And this is just what Christopher had to do. For the rest of the morning, he went around the house, up to every floor, and then outside into the garden, while Dr. Pawson trundled beside him in his armchair and showed him how to cast holding spells to stop the house falling down. Dr. Pawson never seemed to leave that armchair. In all the time Christopher spent with him, he never saw Dr. Pawson walk. Around midday, Dr. Pawson sent his chair gliding into the kitchen, where a cook-maid was sitting dolefully in the midst of smashed butter crocks, spilled milk, bits of basin and dented saucepans, and dabbing at her eyes with her apron. "'Not hurt in here, are you?' Dr. Pawson barked. "'I put a holder on first thing to make sure the range didn't burst and set the house on fire, that sort of thing. That held, didn't it? Water pipe secure?' "'Yes, sir,' gulped the cook-maid. But lunch is ruined, sir. We'll have to have a scratch lunch for once, said Dr. Pawson. His chair swung around to face Christopher. By this evening, he said, this kitchen is going to be mended. Not holding spells, everything as new. I'll show you how. Can't have the kitchen out of action. It's the most important place in the house. I'm sure it is, sir, Christopher said, eyeing Dr. Pawson's mountain of a stomach. Dr. Pawson glared at him. I can dine in college, he said, but my mother needs her nourishment. For the rest of that day, Christopher mended the kitchen, putting crockery back together, recapturing spilled milk and cooking sherry, taking dents out of pans, and sealing a dangerous split at the back of the range. While he did, Dr. Pawson sat in his armchair, warming himself by the range fire, and barking things like, Now put the eggs together, Chant. You'll need the spell to raise them first, then the dirt dispeller you used on the milk. Then you can start the mending spell. While Christopher laboured, the cook-maid, who was obviously even more frightened of Dr. Pawson than Christopher was, edged around him trying to bake a cake and prepare the roast for supper. One way and another... Christopher probably learned more practical magic that day than he had in two and a half terms at school. By the evening, he was exhausted. Dr. Pawson barked, You can go back to your father for now. Be here at nine tomorrow prompt. There's still the rest of the house to see to. 
Oh, Lord! Christopher groaned, too weary to be polite. Can't someone help me at all? I've learned my lesson. What gave you the idea there was only one lesson to learn? bawled Dr. Pawson. Christopher tottered back to the lodging house, carrying the tooth brace, the money and the tie pin wrapped in the grey handkerchief. Papa looked up from a table spread with horoscope sheets. Well, he asked with gloomy eagerness. Christopher fell into a lumpy chair. Silver, he said. Silver stops me working magic. And I hope I have got more than one life, because Dr. Pawson's going to kill me at this rate. Silver, said Papa. Oh, dear. Oh, dear, dear. He was very sad and silent all through the cabbage soup and sausages the lodging house provided for supper. After supper, he said, My son, I have a confession to make. It is my fault that silver stops you working magic. Not only did I cast your horoscope when you were born, but I also cast every other spell I knew to divine your future. And you can imagine my horror when each kind of forecast foretold that silver would mean danger or death to you. Papa paused, drumming his fingers on the horoscope sheets and staring absently at the wall. Argent, he said musingly. Argent means silver. Could I have got it wrong? He pulled himself sadly back together. Well, it's too late to do anything about that except to warn you again to have nothing to do with your Uncle Rafe. But why is it your fault? Christopher asked, very uncomfortable at the way Papa's thoughts were going. There is no getting around fate, Papa said, as I should have known. I cast my strongest spells and put forth all my power to make silver neutral to you. Silver, any contact with silver, seems to transform you at once into an ordinary person without a magic gift at all. And I see now that this could have its dangers. I take it you can work magic when you are not touching silver. Christopher gave a weary laugh. Oh, yes, like anything. Papa brightened a little. Oh, that's a relief. Then my sacrifice here was not in vain. As you know, Christopher, I very foolishly lost your mamma's money and my own by investing it where I thought my horoscopes told me to. He shook his head sadly. Horoscopes are tricky, particularly with money. Be that as it may, I am finished. I regard myself as a failure. You are all I have left to live for, my son. Any success I am to know, I shall know through you. If Christopher had not been so tired, he would have found this decidedly embarrassing. Even through his weariness, he found he was annoyed that he was expected to live for Papa and not on his own account. Would it be fair, he wondered, to use magic to make yourself a famous cricketer? You could make the ball go any way you wanted. Would Papa regard this as success? He knew perfectly well that Papa would not. By this time his eyes were closing themselves, and his head was nodding. When Papa sent him off to bed, Christopher fell onto the twanging mattress and slept like a log. He had meant, honestly meant, to go to the place between and tell Tackroy all that had happened, but either he was just too tired or too scared that Papa would guess. Whatever the reason was, he did not have any dreams of any kind that night. For the next three weeks, Dr. Pawson kept Christopher so hard at work mending the house that he fell into bed each night too weary to dream. Each morning when Christopher arrived, Dr. Pawson was sitting in his armchair in the hall, waiting for him. To work, chant, he would bark. Christopher took to replying, Really, sir? I thought we were going to have a lazy day like yesterday. The strange thing about Dr. Pawson was that he did not mind this kind of remark in the least. Once Christopher got used to him, he discovered that Dr. Pawson rather liked people to stand up to him, 
and once he had discovered that, Christopher found that he did not really hate Dr. Pawson, or only in the way you hate a violent thunderstorm you happen to be caught in. He found he quite liked rebuilding the house, though perhaps the thing which he really liked was working magic that actually did something. Every spell he did had a real use. That made it far more interesting than the silly things he had tried to learn at school. And the hard work was much easier to bear when he was able to say things to Dr. Pawson that would have caused masters at school to twist his ears and threaten to cane him for insolence. Chant! Dr. Pawson howled from his armchair in the middle of the lawn. Chant! The chimney pots on the right are crooked! Christopher was balanced on the tiles of the roof, shivering in the wind. It was raining that day, so he was having to maintain a shelter spell for the roof and for the lawn while he worked. And he had put the chimneys straight four times already. Yes, sir, of course, sir, he screamed back. Would you like them turned to gold, too, sir? None of that, or I'll make you do it, Dr. Pawson yelled. When Christopher came to mend Dr. Pawson's mother's room, he made the mistake of trying to treat old Mrs. Pawson the same way. She was sitting up in a bed heaped with plaster from the ceiling, looking quite comfortable and composed, knitting something striped and long. "'I saved the looking-glass, child,' she remarked with a pleasant smile. "'But that is as far as my powers stretch. Be good enough to mend the chamber-pot first, and count yourself fortunate, child, that it had not been used.' You will find it under the bed. Christopher fished it out in three broken white pieces and got to work. Mend it quite straight, old Mrs. Pawson said, her knitting needles clattering away. Make sure the handle is not crooked and the gold rim around the top is quite regular. Please do not leave any uncomfortable lumps or unsightly bulges, child. Her voice was gentle and pleasant and it kept interrupting the spell. At length Christopher asked in exasperation, Would you like it studded with diamonds, too? Or shall I just give it a posy of roses in the bottom? Thank you, child, said Mrs. Pawson. The posy of roses, please. I think that's a charming idea. Dr. Pawson, sitting by in his armchair, was full of glee at Christopher's discomfiture. "'Sarcasm never pays, Chant,' he bawled. "'Roses require a creation spell. Listen carefully.' After that, Christopher had to tackle the maids' rooms. Then he had to mend all the plumbing. Dr. Pawson gave him a day off on Sunday so that Papa could take him to church. Christopher, now that he knew what he could do, toyed with the idea of making the church spire melt like a candle— but he never quite dared to do it, with Papa pacing soberly beside him. Instead, he experimented in other ways. Every morning, while he was walking up the Trumpington Road, he tried to coax the trees that lined it into a different pattern. He got so good at it that before long he could shunt them up the road in a long line and crowd them into a wood at the end. In the evenings, tired though he was, he could not resist trying to make the lodging house supper taste better. But food magic was not easy. What do they put in sausages these days? Papa remarked. These taste of strawberry. Then came a morning when Dr. Pawson shouted from his chair in the hall, Right, Chant, from now on you've finished the mending in the afternoons. In the mornings we teach you some control. Control? Christopher said blankly. By this time the house was nearly finished, and he was hoping that Dr. Pawson would soon have finished with him too. That's right, Dr. Pawson bawled. You didn't think I'd let you loose on the world without teaching you to control your power, did you? As you are now, you're a menace to everyone. And don't tell me you haven't been trying to see what you can do, because I won't believe you. Christopher looked at his feet and thought of what he had just been doing with the trees in the Trumpington Road. I've hardly done anything, sir. Hardly anything. What do boys know of restraint? said Dr. Pawson. Into the garden. 
we're going to raise a wind, and you're going to learn to do it without moving so much as a blade of grass. They went into the garden, where Christopher raised a whirlwind. He thought it rather expressed his feelings. Luckily it was quite small, and only destroyed one rosebed. Dr. Pawson cancelled it with one flap of his purple banana hand. Do it again, chant. Learning control was boring, but it was a good deal more restful. Dr. Pawson obviously knew this. He began setting Christopher homework to do in the evenings. All the same, even after disentangling the interlacing spells in the problems he had been set, Christopher began to feel for the first time that he had some brain left over to think with. He thought about silver first. Keeping Uncle Rafe's silver sixpence in his pocket had stopped him doing such a lot, and that beastly toothbrace had stopped him doing even more. What a waste! No wonder he had not been able to take the books to the goddess until Matron made him take the brace out. He must have been using magic to get to the anywheres all these years without knowing it, except that he had known it in an underneath sort of way. Tackroy had known, and he had been impressed. And the goddess must have realised too when her silver bracelet turned Christopher into a ghost. Here, Christopher tried to go on thinking about the goddess, but he found he kept thinking of Tackroy instead. Tackroy would now have gone into a trance uselessly for three weeks running. Tackroy made light of it, but Christopher suspected that going into a trance took a lot out of a person. He really would have to let Uncle Rafe know what had happened. Glancing over at Papa, who was hard at work with a special pen marking special symbols on horoscopes under the big oil lamp, Christopher started writing a letter to Uncle Rafe, pretending it was part of his homework. The oil lamp cast shadows on Papa's face, removing the threadbare look and making him look unusually kind and stern. Christopher told himself uneasily that Papa and Uncle Rafe just did not like one another. Besides, Papa had not actually forbidden him to write to Uncle Rafe. All the same, it took several nights to write the letter. Christopher did not want to seem disloyal to Papa. In the end, he simply wrote that Papa had taken him away from school to be taught by Dr. Pawson. It was a lot of effort for such a short letter. He posted it next day on his way up the Trumpington Road with a sense of relief and virtue. Three days later, Papa had a letter from Mama. Christopher could tell at once from Papa's face that Uncle Rafe had told Mama where they were. Papa threw the letter on the fire and fetched his hat. Christopher, he said, I shall be coming with you to Dr. Pawson's today. This made Christopher certain that Mama was in Cambridge too. As he walked up the Trumpington Road beside Papa, he tried to work out what his feelings were about that. But he did not have much time to think. A strong wind, scented with roses, swept around the pair of them, hurling Christopher sideways and snatching Papa's hat from his head. Papa made a movement to chase his hat, which was just rolling under a brewer's dray, and then dived around and seized Christopher's arm instead. Hats are expendable, he said. Keep walking, son. They kept walking, with the wind hurling and buffeting around them. Christopher could actually feel it trying to curl around him in order to pull him away. But for Papa's grip on his arm, he would have been carried across the road. He was impressed. He had not known Mama's magic was this strong. I can control it if you want, he called to Papa above the noise. Dr. Pawson taught me wind control. No, Christopher, Papa panted sternly, looking strange and most undignified with his coat flapping and his hair blowing in all directions. A gentleman never works magic against a woman, particularly his own mamma. Gentlemen, it seemed to Christopher, made things unreasonably difficult for themselves in that case. The wind grew stronger and stronger the nearer they got to the gate of Dr. Pawson's house. Christopher thought they would never cover the last yard or so. 
Papa was forced to seize the gatepost to hold them both in place while he tried to undo the latch, whereupon the wind made a last savage snatch. Christopher felt his feet leave the ground and knew he was about to soar away. He made himself very heavy, just in time. He did it because it was a contest, really, because he did not like being on the losing side. He would not at all have minded seeing Mama, but he very much hoped Papa would not notice the rather large dents his feet had made in the ground just outside the gate. Inside the gate there was no more wind. Papa smoothed his hair and rang the doorbell. Aha! shouted Dr. Pawson from his armchair while Mary Ellen was opening the door. The expected trouble has come to pass, I see. Chant, oblige me by going upstairs and reading aloud to my mother while I talk to your father. Christopher went up the stairs as slowly as he dared, hoping to hear what was being said. All he caught was Dr. Pawson's voice, hardly shouting at all. I've been in touch almost daily for a week, but they still can't... After that, the door shut. Christopher went on up the stairs and knocked at the door of old Mrs. Pawson's room. She was sitting up in bed, still knitting. "'Come and sit on that chair so that I can hear you,' she said in her gentle voice, and gave him a gentle but piercing smile. "'The Bible is here on the bedside table. You may start from the beginning of Genesis, child, and see how far you can get.' I expect the negotiations will take time. Such things always do. Christopher sat down and began to read. He was stumbling among the people who begat other people when Mary Ellen came in with coffee and biscuits and gave him a welcome break. Ten minutes later, old Mrs. Pawson took up her knitting and said, Continue, child. Christopher had got well into Sodom and Gomorrah and was beginning to run out of voice when old Mrs. Pawson cocked her white head on one side and said, Stop now, child. They want you downstairs in the study. Much relieved and very curious, Christopher put the Bible down and shot to the ground floor. Papa and Dr. Pawson were sitting facing one another in Dr. Pawson's crowded room. It had become more cluttered than ever over the last weeks, since it was stacked with pieces of clocks and ornaments from all over the house waiting for Christopher to mend. Now it looked more disorganised still. Tables and carpets had been pushed to the walls to leave a large stretch of bare floorboards, and a design had been chalked on the boards. Christopher looked at it with interest, wondering what it had to do with Mama. It was a five-pointed star, inside a circle. He looked at Papa, who was obviously delighted about something, and then at Dr. Pawson, who was just as usual. "'News for you, Chant,' said Dr. Pawson. "'I've run a lot of tests on you these last weeks. Don't stare, boy, you didn't know I was doing it. And every one of those tests gives you nine lives. Nine lives and some of the strongest magic I've met.' Naturally, I got in touch with Gabriel DeWitt. I happen to know he's been looking for a successor for years. Naturally, all I got was a lot of guff about the way they'd already tested you and drawn a blank. That's civil servants for you. They need a bomb under them before they'll change their minds. So today, after the bother with your mamma had given me the excuse we needed, I had a good old shout at them. They caved in, Chant. They're sending a man to fetch you to Crestomancy Castle now. Here, Papa broke in as if he could not stop himself. It's just what I've been hoping for, my son. Gabriel DeWitt is to become your legal guardian, and in due course you will be the next Crestomancy. Next Crestomancy? Christopher echoed. He stared at Papa, knowing there was no chance of deciding on a career for himself now. It was all settled. His visions of himself as a famous cricketer faded and fell and turned to ashes. But I don't want... Papa thought Christopher did not understand. You will become a very important man, he said. 
you will watch over all the magic in this world and prevent any harm being done with it. But Christopher began angrily. It was too late. The misty shape of a person was forming inside the five-pointed star. It solidified into a pale, plump young man with a long face, very soberly dressed in a grey suit and a wide, starched collar that looked much too tight for him. He was carrying a thing like a telescope. Christopher remembered him. The young man was one of the people who had been in the hospital room after everyone had thought Christopher was dead. Good morning, the young man said, stepping out of the star. My name is Flavian Temple. Monsignor de Witt has sent me to examine your candidate. Examine him, shouted Dr. Pawson. I've already done that. What do you people take me for? He rolled his angry eyes at Papa. Civil servants. Flavian Temple obviously found Dr. Pawson quite as alarming as Christopher did. He flinched a bit. Yes, Doctor, we know you have. But my instructions are to verify your findings before proceeding. If this lad could just step into the pentagram... Go on, son, said Papa. Stand inside the star. With a furious, helpless feeling, Christopher stepped into the chalked pattern and stood there while Flavian Temple sighted down the telescope thing at him. There must be a way of making yourself look as if you only had one life, he thought. There had to be. But he had no idea what it was you did. Flavian Temple frowned. I can only make it seven lives. He's already lost two, you fat young fool, Dr. Pawson bellowed. Didn't they tell you anything? Tell him, Chant. I've lost two lives already. Christopher found himself saying. There was some kind of spell on the pattern, otherwise he would have denied everything. See? howled Dr. Pawson. Flavian Temple managed to turn a wince into a polite bow. I do see, Doctor. That being the case, I will, of course, take the boy to be interviewed by Monsignor de Witt. Any final decision has to be Monsignor de Witt's. Christopher perked up at this. Perhaps it was not settled after all. But Papa seemed to think it was. He came and laid an arm around Christopher's shoulders. Goodbye, my son. This makes me a very proud and happy man. Say goodbye to Dr. Pawson. Dr. Pawson behaved as if it were settled too. His chair trundled forward, and he held out a big purple banana finger to Christopher. My chant, take no notice of the official way they go on. This Flavian's a full civil servant like the rest of them. As Christopher shook the purple finger, old Mrs. Pawson materialised, sitting on the arm of Dr. Pawson's chair in her crisp white nightdress, holding her knitting wrapped into a stripy bundle. Goodbye, child she said. You read very nicely. Here is the present I've knitted for you. It's full of protection spells. She leaned forward and draped the knitting around Christopher's neck. It was a scarf about ten feet long, striped in the colours of the rainbow. Thank you, Christopher said politely. Just move up, uh, Christopher, but don't leave the pentagram, said Flavian. He stepped back inside the chalk marks, taking up more than half the space, and took hold of Christopher's arm to keep him inside it. Old Mrs. Pawson waved a withered hand, and without anything more being said, Christopher found himself somewhere quite different. It was even more disconcerting than being carried off from school by Papa. He and Flavian were standing in a much bigger pentagram that was made of white bricks or tiles, built into the floor of a lofty space with a glass dome high overhead. Under the glass dome, a majestic pink marble staircase curled up to the next floor. Stately panelled doors with statues over them opened off the space all around. The most stately had a clock above it as well as a statue and an enormous crystal chandelier hung from the glass dome on a long chain. Behind Christopher, when he twisted around to look, 
was a very grand front door. He could see he was in the front hall of a very big mansion, but nobody thought to tell him where he was. There were people standing around the tiled pentagram waiting for them. And a stately, dismal lot they looked too, Christopher thought. All of them, men and women alike, were dressed in black or grey. The men wore shiny white collars and cuffs, and the women all wore neat black lace mittens. Christopher felt their eyes on him, sizing up, disapproving, coldly staring. He shrank into a very small, grubby boy under those eyes, and realised that he had been wearing the same set of clothes ever since he had left school. Before he had a chance to do more than look around, a man with a little pointed grey beard stepped up to him and took the striped scarf away. He won't be needing this, he said, rather shocked about it. Christopher thought the man was Gabriel DeWitt and was all prepared to hate him, until Flavian said, No, of course, Dr. Simonson, apologising for Christopher. The old lady gave it to him, you know. Shall I... Christopher decided to hate the bearded man anyway. One of the ladies, a small, plump one, stepped forward then. Thank you, Flavian, she said in a final, bossy sort of way. I'll take Christopher to Gabriel now. Follow me, young man. She turned and went swishing off towards the pink marble stairs. Flavian gave Christopher a nudge, and Christopher stepped out of the tiled pattern and followed her, feeling about a foot high and dirty all over. He knew his collar was sticking up at one side, and that his shoes were dusty, and he could feel the hole in his left sock sliding out of its shoe and showing itself to everyone in the hall as he went upstairs after the lady. At the top of the stairs was a very tall, solid-looking door, the only one in a row of doors that was painted black. The lady swished up to the black door and knocked. She opened it and pushed Christopher firmly inside. Here he is, Gabriel, she said. Then she shut the door behind him and went away, leaving Christopher alone in an oval-shaped room where it seemed to be twilight or sunset. The room was panelled in dark brown wood with a dark brown carpet on the floor. The only furniture seemed to be a huge dark desk. As Christopher came in, a long, thin figure reared up from behind the desk, about six foot six of skinny old man, Christopher realised, when his heart stopped thumping. The old man had a lot of white hair and the whitest face and hands Christopher had ever seen. His eyebrows jutted, and his cheeks stood out in wide peaks, making the eyes between them look sunken and staring. Below that was a hooked beak of nose. The rest of the old man's face went into a small, sharp point, containing a long, grim mouth. The mouth opened to say, I am Gabriel DeWitt. So we meet again, Master Chant. Christopher knew he would have remembered if he had ever seen this old man before. Gabriel DeWitt was even more memorable than Dr. Pawson. I've never seen you in my life before, he said. I have met you. You were unconscious at the time, Gabriel DeWitt said. I suppose this accounts for our being so strangely mistaken in you. I can see now at a glance that you do indeed have seven lives, and should have nine. There were quite a lot of windows in the twilight room, Christopher saw, at least six of them, in a high, curving row near the ceiling. The ceiling was a sort of orange, which seemed to keep all the light from the windows to itself. All the same, it was a mystery to Christopher how a room with quite so many windows could end up being so very dark. In spite of this, Gabriel DeWitt said, I am very dubious about taking you on. Your heredity frankly appalls me. The chants give themselves out as a race of respectable enchanters, but they produce a black sheep every generation, while the Argents, though admittedly gifted, are the kind of people I would not nod to in the street. These traits have come out in both your parents. 
I gather your father is bankrupt and your mother a contemptible social climber. Even Cousin Francis had not said anything quite as bald as this. Anger flared through Christopher. Oh, thank you, sir, he said. There's nothing I like more than a polite warm welcome like that. The old man's eagle eyes stared. He seemed puzzled. I felt it only fair to be frank with you, he said. I wished you to understand that I have agreed to become your legal guardian because we do not consider either of your parents a fit person to have charge of the future crestomancy. Yes, sir, said Christopher, angrier than ever. But you needn't bother. I don't want to be the next crestomancy. I'd rather lose all my lives first. Gabriel DeWitt simply looked impatient. Yes, yes, this is often the way until we realize the job needs doing, he said. I refused the post myself when it was first offered to me, but I was in my twenties and you are a mere child, even less capable of deciding than I was. Besides, we have no choice in the matter. You and I are the only nine-lifed enchanters in all the related worlds. He made a gesture with one white hand. A small bell chimed somewhere, and the plump young lady swished into the room. "'Miss Rosalie here is my chief assistant,' Gabriel DeWitt said. "'She will show you to your room and get you settled in. "'I have allotted Flavian Temple to you as a tutor, though I can ill spare him, "'and I will, of course, be teaching you myself twice a week as well.' Christopher followed Miss Rosalie's swishing skirt past the line of doors and down a long corridor. Nobody seemed to care what he felt. He wondered whether to show them by raising another whirlwind. But there was a spell on this place, a strong, thick spell. After Dr. Pawson's teaching, Christopher was sensitive to all spells, and though he was not sure what this one did... He was fairly sure it would make things like whirlwinds pretty useless. "'Is this Crestomancy Castle?' he asked angrily. "'That's right,' Miss Rosalie said. "'The government took it over two hundred years ago after the last really wicked enchanter was beheaded.' She turned to smile at him over her shoulder. "'Gabriel de Witt's a dear, isn't he? I know he seems a bit dry at first, but he's adorable when you get to know him.' Christopher stared. Dear and adorable seemed to him the last words he would ever use to describe Gabriel de Witt. Miss Rosalie did not see him stare. She was throwing open a door at the end of the corridor. There, she said rather proudly. I hope you like it. We're not used to having children here, so we've all been racking our brains over how to make you feel at home. There was not much sign of it, Christopher thought, staring around a large brown room with one high white bed, looking rather lonely in one corner. Thanks, he said glumly. When Miss Rosalie left him, he found there was a brown Spartan washroom at the other end of the room and a shelf by the window. There was a teddy bear on the shelf, a game of snakes and ladders, and a copy of the Arabian Nights with all the dirty bits taken out. He put them in a heap on the floor and jumped on them. He knew he was going to hate Crestomancy Castle. For the first week, Christopher could think of nothing else but how much he hated Crestomancy Castle and the people in it. It seemed to combine the worst things about school and home with a few special awfulnesses of its own. It was very grand and very big, and except when he was doing lessons, Christopher was forced to wander about entirely on his own, missing O'Neill and Fenning and the other boys and Cricket acutely, while the castle people got on with their grown-up affairs as if Christopher was not there at all. He had nearly all his meals alone in the schoolroom, just like home except that the schoolroom looked out onto the empty, shaven castle lawns. 
We thought you'd be happier not having to listen to our grown-up talk, Miss Rosalie told him as they walked up the long drive from church on Sunday. But of course you'll have Sunday lunch with us. So Christopher sat at the long table with everyone else in their sober Sunday clothes and thought it would have made no difference if he hadn't been there. Voices hummed among the chinking cutlery, and not one of them spoke to him. And you have to add copper to sublimate, whatever the manuals say, the bearded Dr. Simonson was telling Flavian Temple. But after that you can, I find, put it straight to the pentacle with a modicum of fire. The wraith's illegal dragon's blood is simply flooding the market now, said a young lady across the table. Even the honest suppliers are not reporting it. They know they can evade taxes. But the correct words present problems, Dr. Simonson told Flavian. I know statistics are misleading, said a younger man beside Christopher, but my latest sample had twice the legal limit of poison balm. You only have to extrapolate to see how much the gang is bringing in. The flaming tincture must then be passed through gold, Dr. Simonson proclaimed, and another voice cut across his, saying, That magic mushroom essence certainly came from ten, but I think the trap we set there stopped that outlet. While Dr. Simonson added, If you wish to proceed without copper, you'll find it far more complicated. Miss Rosalie's voice rang through his explanation from the other end of the table. But, Gabriel, they had actually butchered a whole tribe of mermaids. I know it's partly our wizard's fault for being willing to pay the earth for mermaid parts, but the wraith really has to be stopped. Gabriel's dry voice answered in the distance. That part of the operation has been closed down. It's the weapons coming in from one that present the biggest problem. My advice is that you then start with pentacle and fire, Dr. Simonson droned on, using the simpler form of words to start the process, but... Christopher sat silent, thinking that if he did get to be the next Crestomancy, he would forbid people to talk about their work at mealtimes. Ever. He was glad when he was allowed to get up from the table and go. But when he did... The only thing to do was to wander about, feeling all the spells on the place itching at him like gnat bites. There were spells in the formal gardens to keep weeds down and encourage worms, spells to keep the giant cedars on the lawns healthy, and spells all around the grounds to keep intruders out. Christopher thought he could have broken that set quite easily and simply run away, except that the sensitivity he had learned from Dr. Pawson showed him that breaking that boundary spell would set alarms ringing in the lodge at the gate, and probably all over the castle, too. The castle itself had an old, crusty part with turrets, and a newer part, which were fused together into a rambling hole. But there was an extra piece of castle that stood out in the gardens, and looked even older, so old that there were trees growing on top of its broken walls. Christopher naturally wanted to explore this part, but there was a strong misdirection spell on it, which caused it to appear behind him or to one side whenever he tried to get to it. So he gave up and wandered indoors, where the spells, instead of itching, pressed down on him like a weight. He hated the castle spells most of all. They would not allow him to be as angry as he felt. They made everything blunt and muffled. In order to express his hatred, Christopher fell back more and more on silent scorn. When people did speak to him, and he had to answer, he was as sarcastic as he knew how to be. This did not help him get on with Flavian Temple. Flavian was a kind and earnest tutor. In the ordinary way, Christopher would have quite liked him even though Flavian wore his collars too tight and tried far too hard to be hushed and dignified like the rest of Gabriel de Witt's people. But he hated Flavian for being one of those people, and he very soon discovered that Flavian had no sense of humour at all. "'You wouldn't see a joke if it jumped up and bit you, would you?' Christopher said the second afternoon. Afternoons were always devoted to magic theory or magic practical. Oh, I don't know, Flavian said. 
Something in Punch made me smile last week. Now, to get back to what we were saying, how many worlds do you think make up the related worlds? Twelve, said Christopher, because he remembered that Tacroy sometimes called the Anywheres the related worlds. Very good, said Flavian. Though actually there are more than that, because each world is really a set of worlds, which we call a series. The only one which is just a single world is eleven, but we needn't bother with that. All the worlds were probably one world to begin with, and then something happened back in prehistory which could have ended in two contradictory ways. Let's say a continent blew up, or it didn't blow up. The two things couldn't both be true at once in the same world, so that world became two worlds, side by side but quite separate, one with that continent and one without, and so on until there were twelve. Christopher listened to this with some interest, because he had always wondered how the Anywheres had come about. And did the series happen the same way? he asked. Yes, indeed, said Flavian, obviously thinking Christopher was a very good pupil. Take series seven, which is a mountain series. In prehistory, the Earth's crust must have buckled many more times than it did here. Or series five, where all the land became islands. None of them larger than France. Now these are the same right across the series, but the course of history in each world is different. It's history that makes the differences. The easiest example is our own series twelve, where our world, which we call World A, is oriented on magic, which is normal for most worlds. But the next world, World B, split off in the fourteenth century and turned to science and machinery. The world beyond that, World C, split off in Roman times and became divided into large empires, and it went on like that up to nine. There are usually nine to a series. Why are they numbered back to front? Christopher asked. Because we think one was the original world of the twelve, Flavian said. Anyway. It was the great mages of one who first discovered the other worlds, and they did the numbering. This was a much better explanation than the one Tacroy had given. Christopher felt obliged to Flavian for it, so that when Flavian asked, "Now, what do you think makes us call these twelve the related worlds?" Christopher felt he owed him an answer. They all speak the same languages, he said. Very good," said Flavian. His pale face went pink with surprise and pleasure. "You are a good pupil." "Oh, I'm absolutely brilliant," Christopher said bitterly. Unfortunately, when Flavian turned to practical magic on alternate afternoons, Christopher was anything but brilliant. With Doctor Pawson, he had become used to spells that really did something. But with Flavian, he went back to small elementary magics of the kind he had been doing at school. They bored Christopher stiff. He yawned and he spilled things, and usually keeping a special vague look on his face so that Flavian would not notice what he was doing, he made the spells work without going through more than half the steps. Oh no, Flavian said anxiously when he did notice, that's Enchanter's magic. We'll be starting on that in a couple of weeks, but you have to know basic witchcraft first. It's most important for you to know whether a witch or wizard is misusing the craft when you come to be the next Crestomancy. That was the trouble with Flavian. He was always saying, "When you come to be the next Crestomancy." Christopher felt bitterly angry. "Is Gabriel De Witt going to die soon?" he said. I don't imagine so. He still has eight lives left," said Flavian. "Why do you ask?" It was a whim," Christopher said, thinking angrily of Papa. "Oh dear," Flavian said, worrying because he was failing to keep his pupil interested. "I know. We'll go out into the gardens and study the properties of herbs. You may like that part of witchcraft better." Down into the gardens they went. Into a raw, grey day. 
It was one of those summers that was more like winter than many winters are. Flavian stopped under a huge cedar and invited Christopher to consider the ancient lore about cedar wood. Christopher was in fact quite interested to hear that cedar was part of the funeral pyre from which the phoenix was reborn, but he was not going to let Flavian see he was. As Flavian talked, his eye fell on the separate ruined piece of castle, and he knew that if he asked about that, Flavian would only tell him that they would be doing misdirection spells next month, which put another thing he wanted to know into his mind. When am I going to learn how to fasten a person's feet to the spot? he asked. Flavian gave him a sideways look. We won't be doing magic that affects other people until next year, he said. Come over to the laurel bushes now and let's consider those. Christopher sighed as he followed Flavian over to the big laurels by the drive. He might have known Flavian was not going to teach him anything useful. As they approached the nearest bush, a ginger cat emerged from among the shiny leaves, stretching and glaring irritably. When it saw Flavian and Christopher, it advanced on them at a trot, purpose all over its savage, lop-eared face. Look out, Flavian said urgently. Christopher did not need telling. He knew what this particular cat could do. But he was so astonished at seeing Throgmorton here at Crestomancy Castle that he forgot to move. Who, whose cat is that? he said. Throgmorton recognized Christopher too. His tail went up, thinner and more snaky than ever, and he stopped and stared. Wong! he said incredulously. And he advanced again, but in a much more stately way, like a prime minister greeting a foreign president. Wong, he said. Careful, said Flavian, prudently backing behind Christopher. It's an Arsheth temple cat. It's safest not to go near it. Christopher, of course, knew that. But Throgmorton was so evidently meaning to be polite that he risked squatting down and cautiously holding out his hand. Yes, Wong to you too, he said. Throgmorton put forward his moth-eaten looking orange nose and dabbed at Christopher's hand with it. Great heavens, the thing actually likes you, said Flavian. Nobody else dares get within yards of it. Gabriel's had to give all the outdoor staff special shielding spells or they said they'd leave. It tears strips off people through ordinary spells. How did it get here, Christopher said letting Throgmorton politely investigate his hand. Nobody knows, at least not how it wandered in here from series ten, Flavian said. Mordecai found it in London, brave man, and brought it here in a basket. He recognized it by its aura, and he said if he could, then most wizards would too, and they'd kill it for its magical properties. Most of us think that wouldn't be much loss, but Gabriel agreed with Mordecai. Christopher had still not learned the names of all the sober-suited men around the Sunday lunch table. Which one is Mr. Mordecai? he said. Mordecai Roberts. He's a particular friend of mine. But you won't have met him yet, said Flavian. He works for us in London these days. Perhaps we could get on with Herb Law now. At that moment, a strange noise broke from Throgmorton's throat a sound like wooden cogwheels not connecting very well. Throgmorton was purring. Christopher was unexpectedly touched. Does he have a name? he asked. Most people just call him that thing, said Flavian. I shall call him Throgmorton, said Christopher, at which Throgmorton's cogwheels went around more noisily than ever. It suits him, said Flavian. Now, please... Consider this laurel. With Throgmorton sauntering amiably beside him, Christopher heard all about laurels and found it all much easier to take. It amused him the way Flavian took care to keep well out of reach of Throgmorton. From then on, in a standoffish way, Throgmorton became Christopher's only friend in the castle. They both seemed to have the same opinion of the people in it. Christopher once saw Throgmorton encounter Gabriel de Witt coming down the pink marble stairs. 
Throgmorton spat and flew at Gabriel's long, thin legs, and Christopher was charmed and delighted at the speed with which those long, thin legs raced up the stairs again to get away. Christopher hated Gabriel more every time he had a lesson with him. He decided that the reason Gabriel's room always seemed so dark, in spite of all its windows, was because it reflected Gabriel's personality. Gabriel never laughed. He had no patience with slowness or mistakes, and he seemed to think Christopher ought to know everything he taught him at once, by instinct. The trouble was that the first week, when Flavian and Gabriel were teaching him about the related worlds, Christopher had known all about them, from the anywheres, and this seemed to have given Gabriel the idea that Christopher was a good learner. But after that, they went on to the different kinds of magics, and Christopher just could not seem to get it through his head why witchcraft and enchanter's magic were not the same, or how wizardry differed from sorcery, and both from magician's magic. It was always a great relief to Christopher when his lesson with Gabriel was over. Afterwards, Christopher usually sneaked Throgmorton indoors, and the two of them explored the castle together. Throgmorton was not allowed inside the castle, which was why Christopher liked to have him there. Once or twice, with luck and cunning from both of them, Throgmorton spent the night on the end of Christopher's bed, purring like a football rattle. But Miss Rosalie had a way of knowing where Throgmorton was. She nearly always arrived wearing gardening gloves and chased Throgmorton out with a broom. Luckily, Miss Rosalie was often busy straight after lessons, so Throgmorton galloped beside Christopher down the long corridors and through the rambling attics, thrusting his face into odd corners and remarking, Wong! from time to time. The castle was huge. The weighty, baffling spells hung heavily over most of it, but there were parts that nobody used where the spells seemed to have worn thin. Christopher and Throgmorton were both happiest in those parts. The third week, they discovered a big round room in a tower, which looked to have been a wizard's workshop at one time. It had shelves around the walls, three long workbenches, and a pentagram painted on the stone floor. But it was deserted and dusty, and stuffy with the smell of old, old magic. Wong, Throgmorton said happily. Yes, Christopher agreed. It seemed a waste of a good room. When I'm the next Crestomancy, he thought, I shall make sure this room is used. Then he was angry with himself, because he was not going to be the next Crestomancy. He had caught the habit from Flavian. But I could make this a secret workshop of my own, he thought. I could sneak stuff up here bit by bit. The next day, he and Throgmorton went exploring for a new attic, where there might be things Christopher could use to furnish the tower room. And they discovered a second tower up a second, smaller, winding stair. The spells were worn away almost entirely here, because this tower was ruinous. It was smaller than the other tower room, and half its roof was missing. Half the floor was wet with that afternoon's rain. Beyond that, there was what had once been a mullioned window. It was now a slope of wet, rubbly wall, with one stone pillar standing out of it. Wong, wong, Throgmorton uttered approvingly. He went trotting over the wet floor and jumped up onto the broken wall. Christopher followed him eagerly. They both climbed out onto the slope of rubble beyond what was left of the window and looked down at the smooth lawn and the tops of the cedar trees. Christopher caught a glimpse of the separate piece of castle with the misdirection spell on it. It was almost out of sight beyond the knobby stonework of the tower, but he thought he should be high enough to see into it over the trees growing on top of it. Holding on to the pillar that had been part of the window, he stepped further out on the broken slope and leaned right out to see. The pillar snapped in half. Christopher's feet shot forward on the slippery stones. He felt himself plunge through the air and saw the cedars rushing past upside down. Bother, he thought, another life. He remembered that the ground stopped him with a terrible jolt. 
and he had a vague notion that Throgmorton somehow followed him down and then proceeded to make an appalling noise.